We now go into public session. Um, we've, uh, the purpose of the meeting today is to consider that the, ex the extreme delays recently experienced by passengers at Dublin Airport and the DA's detailed plans and solutions to address this. I am pleased to welcome from the DA today Mr. Daunton Phillips, CEO of the Dublin Airport Authority, who is accompanied by Mr. Uh, Gary McLean, Deputy Managing Director, Dublin Airport, Ms. Catherine Gobbins, Group Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Vincent Harrison, Managing Director, Dublin, uh, Director, Dublin Airport, um, Mr. Morris Hennessy, Chief Information and Security Operations Officer, Ms. Louise Bannon, Head of Marketing. Mr. Brendan O'Hanlon, Head of ERIR, and Mr. Kevin Cullinan, Group Head of Communications. I'd like to thank Mr. Uh, Phillips uh, for agreeing to meet the committee on this important matter at such short notice. So uh, you're welcome, uh, Mr. Phillips. And obviously, we await with great interest on the outline of your plans. Uh, we, as a committee, obviously, the Transport Committee, falling under our remit. And this is really about the public today. Uh, this has been screened live on RT News Now, and I think what the public want at this stage is reassurance that if they turn up at Dublin Airport over the June Bank holiday weekend, that they'll be able to get their flight, they won't miss their flight, and they won't be there for an inordinate length of time, and then future plans of how you'll deal with it as well. So, note on privilege, uh, witnesses are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice that you should not criticise or make charges against any person or entity by naming by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable, or otherwise engage in speech that might be regarded as damage to the good name of the person or entity. Therefore, if your statements are potentially inflammatory in relation to an identified person or entity, you will be directed to discontinue your remarks. Uh, it is imperative that you comply with any such direction. Uh, members are reminded of the long-standing uh, parliamentary uh, practice to the effect that uh, they should not comment on, criticise, or make charges against a person outside the houses or an official either by name in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I would like to remind uh, members of the constitutional requirement that members must be physically present within the confines of the Leinster House complex in order to partake in public meetings. I will not permit a member to participate where they are not in use this constitutional requirement. Therefore, any member who attempts to, to participate from outside the precincts will be reluctantly asked to leave the meeting. In this regard, I would ask any member partaking via MS Teams that prior to making their contribution to the meeting that you confirm your undergrounds of the Leinster House campus. If attending in the committee room, you are asked to exercise personal responsibility to protect yourself and others from the risk of contacting COVID-19. Um, I now invite Mr Phillips of the DA to make his opening statement. Mr Phillips. Ahula. Members of the committee, good afternoon and thank you for inviting DAA and members of my team to address the committee this afternoon. To begin with, I would like to take the opportunity to address our passengers directly and to apologise unreservedly to everyone who's been impacted by the challenges at Dublin Airport last weekend. That experience jars with our tradition of providing a positive passenger experience for our passengers. While the past number of weeks have been challenging, I fully appreciate that what our passengers experienced at the airport last weekend fell extremely short of our desired standards. I appreciate the anger, frustration and upset that this has caused. Put simply, we failed in our duty to our passengers and I want to offer my deep apologies to everyone impacted and indeed to the members of the Arctis here as I also recognise the reputational damage to our country for which connectivity and ease of access is our lifeblood. I also want to assure passengers that if you were affected by last weekend's queues, you will be not left out of pocket these challenges were not our passengers making in any way and we'll work closely with everyone impacted to make sure that they are not impacted financially. If passengers were affected by last weekend's events, I would ask them to complete the online form on our website at dublinairport.com or email 
customer experience at dublinairport.com and we will ensure speedily recompense. I also want to take a moment at the outset of today's meetings to acknowledge the incredible efforts of all of DAA's employees during what has been a hugely challenging time. Our people, and I know many of the, the members here today know this, they're fiercely proud of our organization and their commitment and their efforts have been outstanding, particularly over recent weeks and months. However, I appreciate that apologies are not what the people are most interested in today. The committee and the public will be very keen to understand, and I know the, the chairman asked me about this, you know, number one, exactly how these challenges have arisen. Number two, the immediate steps that we are taking as a business to address them and to ensure that last Sunday's events will not be repeated. There are three factors which have led us to the current situation, which I've outlined in detail in my statement. For the record, though, let me briefly say the following. The unexpectedly rapid rise in passenger numbers affecting the global aviation industry. The significant challenges in recruitment, particularly in security screening as a result of the new European Union's enhanced background checks. And number three, the absence due to COVID at the start of the year. The combination of these three factors had a significant impact on the business and created very significant cues for our passengers on March the 27th, following which we've implemented a significant work programme to address these challenges. Firstly, since recruitment began in 2021, we have now recruited over 300 new airport search unit officers, with 150 officers recruited since the end of April 2022 alone. We'll bring another 70 officers on board over the coming weeks, and DAA has set no upward limit on recruitment numbers. However, given the absolute criticality of security training, the process of onboarding these new staff cannot be rushed. And while we're making significant progress, it will take us another month before we get the full complement of additional trained security officers deployed on the floor of the airport. We've deployed a company-wide task force of officer-based staff and senior management. This includes more than 400 people who have now worked over 2,000 shifts and over 8,500 hours in support of our frontline team. And all of my team here have done multiple 3 a.m. starts in the airport over the, over the previous months. We've also introduced overtime and incentives for our security staff, secured additional external queue management resources, and introduced a wide range of process improvements, passenger experiences, and communication initiatives. In fact, Chairman, you'll remember I wrote to you as recently as last Friday on the positive progress that we've been achieving across a whole range of key initiatives, which have led to an improved service level. And up until last weekend, Chairman, 94%, so 94% of all departing passengers traveling through the airport had cleared security in 45 minutes or less during May, while almost 80% had cleared security in 30 minutes or less. However, the fact remains that we have been and are still managing a resource gap as we pivot from losses of nearly a million euros a day and a thousand redundancies during the COVID pandemic to a dramatic recovery of air travel, which has been faster and earlier than anybody could have predicted. In parallel with our substantial recruitment and resourcing up process, set to deliver a further increase in processing capacity this month and next month, we've been operating to a plan, albeit one that is pre pre predicated on very fine margins and the Herculean efforts of our staff. So reflecting on last weekend, Friday saw a similar number of passengers pass through Dublin Airport as Sunday, and travel on the Friday was without incident and without undue delay. On Sunday, that plan failed. Let me explain why and also why I have confidence in our updated plan. On Sunday last, we had rostered and resourced staff to meet the demands of serving 50,000 departing passengers across both Terminals 1 and 2, 
with 200 security officers and a further 24 team supervisors and coordinators on duty. This would have allowed us to open sufficient security lanes and X-ray machines to cater for the first wave of departing passengers. However, on that day, we were 37 officers, officers down, 37. So 17 of these officers were new recruits which were on our rostering system. And the rostering system had anticipated that they would have completed training, which would allow them to work last Sunday. But in fact, they had not yet been certified. So this anomaly has since been resolved in our processes. So 17 um, weren't there that should have been there, and that was a process issue, and we've since fixed that. We also incurred a loss of 20 officers that were absent from work on that day. Many of the 37 staff have particular clearances and certifications required to open and operate a lane. And so they can't be readily substituted by other DAA staff. Without this capacity, we were unable to bring in substitute staff at short notice in the early hours of Sunday morning. This compounded the queuing problem throughout much of Sunday. And the impact of this reduction in our anticipated human resources meant, or you know, in, in anticipated team, should I say, meant that we were unable to open six security lanes, three in each terminal, which was a loss of 30% capacity in the first wave. Each lane ordinarily screens about 200 passengers per, per hour, and being down six lanes, we had a processing deficit of 1,200 passengers per hour. So we were unable to achieve our anticipated productivity, and this quickly led to queues forming in security. As more and more passengers joined the growing queues for the available security lanes, the situation became compounded, leading to a decision at 10.30 a.m. to advise those passengers queuing outside the terminal with flights departing before noon that they would not make their flights. This leads me to what will be a very different bank holiday weekend and into the extremely busy summer months of June, July and August ahead. So if, you, if you're okay, Chairman, I'll just give you our, our, our plans. Okay. We're focusing on passenger experience improvements across three core areas while also introducing new escalation and triage mechanisms in the event of any unanticipated issues arising. We have submitted a detailed plan to the committee that is focused on a better passenger experience. And there are a number of key areas as follows. So maximizing, number one, the availability of staff resources, increasing the number of security lanes open at peak times, and improving queue management. And there's a detailed plan which Hopefully, uh, at a later stage in this session, uh, Chairman, I'll be able to take the, take the committee through. Can I just give a quick outline to the yeah, public? Okay. No. Okay. So, there are, there are four. Well, I, I'll go to our passenger advice because I think passengers are very, very keen to understand that. Our passenger advice to passengers due to fly out of Dublin Airport over the coming period is to arrive at the airport at least two and a half hours before the departure of a short haul flight to Europe and the UK, and at least three and a half hours for long haul flights. At times when the terminal gets particularly busy, be it this weekend or into the future, we will be triaging access to the terminals and only allowing departing passengers into the departure level that are flights departing with two and a half hours to short haul destinations and three and a half hours to long haul destinations, as I said. So passengers that arrive too early for their flights, if, if we need to invoke the triage, will be asked to wait in a dedicated passenger, passenger holding area outside of the terminal with special consideration being given to those passengers who require special assistance and those important flyers traveling obviously with things like autism. So for departing passengers, access to the appropriate terminals will be controlled and will require the presentation of documentation indicating the time of flight, such as a booking confirmation or a boarding card. T 
DAA will put in bad weather cover, seating and toilets in the holding area as quickly as possible in the coming days following trialling of the system over the June bank holiday weekend. We don't anticipate we'll need it this weekend, but this is what we will be building for the summer, Chairman, and we can go into more details. So what I would say, Chairman, is following these incremental measures, we're confident, confident, we have a robust plan, and we do not envisage a repeat of what happened last Sunday. We don't envisage that. You might give a summary of your plan there yeah. in yeah. terms of okay. you know, extra okay. staff so public will know what you're putting in place. Okay. But though challenges remain, the measures we have taken will, be very, will very substantially mitigate the risk of this weekend uh, and beyond. And should an unanticipated issues arise, we will have appropriate escalation and triage mechanism focused on ensuring no passengers miss their flights. So I hope, Chairman, uh, and I'll cover this now, uh, and obviously members of the committee, um, that the, the specific initiatives and actions that DAA has been taking in recent weeks and months, um, you, we have made a lot of progress. We've, you know, we, we had a very difficult Sunday. We let a lot of our passengers down. But we have a, we have a plan around our staffing plan. So for this weekend, we will have 40 additional security officers working over the weekend. We will increase our staffing by 10% versus last weekend, okay? So 10% increase. Um, and and there's, you know, there's, there's a number of details we could get into. We'll have a very detailed security plan which will increase our productivity by 10%. Now, last Friday, okay, and this coming Friday, for example, they're fairly similar numbers, okay? We'll have 10% more people in place. We will have 10% more productivity. Um, and and we, we, will, we will have a number of activity, activities in place to ensure that uh, people can have confidence that they will make their flights. We have an operations and safety plan in place. And clearly, safety has to be the number one issue, getting people safely onto the flights. And we'll have a very strong communication plan around the two and a half hours and the three and a half hours. So challenges remain, but we continue to operate a very tight operation with finite margin for error. A very significant program of work is ongoing by dedicated people to bring the operation back to the standards our customers should be able to expect. And we want all our passengers to have a very positive experience traveling into and out of Dublin Airport. And as the summer season ramps up, we'll continue to drive improvements in our overall service offering to this end. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, uh, Mr. Dalton. And now go to members. Uh, obviously, the public are looking in, so we want to get answers uh, from the DEA as to how this happened and how you're going to ensure the details of the plan. So I'm going to ask members, uh, I'll be giving seven minutes, I'll give six minutes initially, and then they will have a further minute. I would ask members in the interest of getting the maximum use of this particular session for the public who are looking in on RT Now News Channel, and we thank RT for covering it, that we can get the maximum extraction of information. So members of the public that are going to be flying from Dublin Airport this weekend will have absolute clarity and assurance that they will get their flight and that they will not be waiting an ordinary amount of time and in terms of the safety and generally the, the facilities at Dublin Airport. So first up is Deputy James O'Connor. You have six minutes and when once the six minutes are concluded I will allow further minutes so I just want you to keep an eye on the clock. Of course, Chairperson, and just first and foremost to welcome um, the representatives of the DEA before the committee today. Uh, what happened uh, over the course of the weekend is profoundly regrettable and has done remarkable damage in your organisation and to the state. I think it's important that this committee would ask a number of key questions regarding the operational failures at Dublin, of Dublin Airport over the weekend. And the first one I want to ask is that in 2021, your organisation received, particularly in Dublin, about 97.2 million euros in direct exchequer support for the operational uh, parts of the airport. And may I ask, in regards to that funding, was any of it used in terms of the retention of staff at the airport? Or why was it not used regarding the retention of security staff? 
But you kind of the 97 million was from the government explicitly to go to the airlines as an incentive scheme to um, uh, incentivize airlines to operate schedules this summer. You'll remember that there was a very uh, no commentator believed that traffic would come back to pre-COVID levels until 2024 or 2025. Uh, out of concern for that and all that needed to be done to incentivize traffic in and out of the country, the government put 97 million in. We didn't receive a single penny of that. That went to the airlines in terms of reduced airport charges. When it came to the retention of staff, staff, Mr Phillips, what supports were provided by government in order to keep your organisation going? You've outlined in your opening statement that you were losing approximately a million euros per each day. When it, comes, when it came to those types of financial supports, what were you in receipt of? So, Deputy O'Connor, we are in receipt of um, the supports that any other business uh, in the country would have, would have received. We get no special supports whatsoever. We are a fully commercial organisation. We have to access the debt markets to raise uh, capital, uh, and we, we receive no extra support. So we did avail of the, the temporary wage subsidy scheme. There were some rate waivers that were in place, but they were the same for any co company right across the country. We did not get any specific supports um, directly to the DAA because of our unique situation. Okay, so obviously you were in receipt of EWAS, if that's particularly the case. And so I'm why was EWAS not used to retain the security staff? Well, so I suppose just to give you a little bit of context around our financial profile just before COVID and indeed... No, that's not the question I asked. I'm, I'm really I'm limited to, time. Yeah. I'm so sorry. But in, re in relation to the receipt of EWIS that you would have got, like so many other businesses, why was that not used to retain key critical staff, particularly the staff in question here, which do take a very significant amount of time, amount of time uh, to train into their particular positions? Yeah, Connor, we, were, we were losing one million euros every single day. Uh, our net debt doubled. Um, we had to reduce costs. We did not know how long this pandemic was going to go on for. We certainly didn't think that it was going to recover in 2022 to the extent it has. As I said, it was 2024, 2025. So we reduced our overall staffing level by 25% with a voluntary severance scheme across the business. And that got us down to about 70% of what we needed. We felt, Deputy O'Connor, that going into 2022 with 70% of our staff, we'd be okay. And we Mr. Were wrong. Phillips, did you communicate those points to the Minister for Transport and the Minister of State of Responsibility for Aviation? Did you tell them what potentially could happen? And my understanding was there was about approximately 50,000 travel through the weekend, or through the airport on, on Sunday in particular. But we could be going up to as, as, as much as 100,000 in a number of weeks' time per day. So, you know. Did you communicate the potential ramifications of these staff being let go to the minister and to the department? Deputy O'Connor, we had to let people go. We thought we would not be at but this I had level. To, I asked you a very specific question, Mr Phillips, and you appreciate with very limited time. Were those particular points communicated with the Department of Transport, with the minister and the relevant officials in that department about what potentially could happen? Uh, we would have explained that there was a risk when you downsize, but that was a risk that we took. It wasn't that- I think it's important for everybody's professional reput reputation here that that particular point is expanded upon. I'm genuinely trying to give all of you yeah. the benefit of the doubt. I'm yeah. being fair here, but was that communicated? So we, I, we, I, I, I would take that as a yes. Yes, I, I'm just trying to put some color on it, Deputy O'Connor, which is when you're downsizing, we, we, we took all the industry analysts' um, data and we worked through that to try and predict what the traffic levels would be for 2022, 23, 24. And we reduced our overall cost base to meet that. We were wildly wrong in terms of the recovery levels that happened once uh, the travelling public, and I'm just talking about from March onwards, Deputy O'Connor started travelling. January and February, as you know, were very concerning months. We had Ukraine, we had Omicron. From March, it took off at a level we were not experienced, had not expected, and therefore we were behind where we needed to be in terms of our recruitment. 
Let's talk about the projections for a second. I, that is interesting. We were told in this committee repeatedly that it would be approximately 2025 before we returned to 2019 levels. How quickly do you now, on today's figures, uh, feel that you're going to get back to going north of 30 million passengers a year? We will be annualising... Uh, well, we'll be north of 30 next year, and if you were to take a run rate from the middle of this summer and project it 12 months, Deputy O'Connor... So you're going to arrive at that position two years early? Correct. Mm -hmm. Is the infrastructure in Terminal 1 in particular in Dublin Airport capable of handling those numbers again, or is it all down to staffing? So the infrastructure is able to, to, to manage that level of throughput. Um, we did it. We, we were actually 33 million passengers pre-pandemic, and we'll be 30-plus next year. So it is. But the limiting resource we have is security screeners at the moment. And you and I, Deputy O'Connor, cannot do that. It is a, you need to be certified. It's a skilled role. And we need to dramatically increase the amount of screeners we have in our business. And at the moment, we do not have enough. Mr Phillips, my final question to you is my time is, time is very, very limited, right? If you, you know what's coming down the tracks, we're going to be hitting a position in a few weeks' time which is going to be remarkably different, difficult for Dublin Airport to handle. Would you not look at the key regional airports in Cork Airport, which you, your organisation manage, and the likes of Shannon, for other routes to be located at those airports as a temporary measure to get over the situation we're in? Because a 1,000 people missed their flight. If this, if this gets any worse, it could be much more significant than that. So would you not look at that potential emergency action, working with the other airports to redirect some flights on a temporary basis to get you over the position that you now currently find yourself in? To, to conclude, uh, Mr. Phillips. To, to conclude, Deputy O'Connor, the airlines make the choice about where they fly their aircraft. The airport doesn't. So we provide the infrastructure. So we don't direct where an airline flies to. That's... That's what the airline does. At this point in time, you cannot handle the, air, the traffic that's coming through the airport. That's hugely concerning. And I think okay. that is food for thought, Chairman, that we need okay. to try and come up with a plan there in that particular regard. Right. Thank um, you. Um, yeah, just um, our main focus today is about passengers, the 100,000 per day coming to Dublin Airport this weekend, the worries they have. And I, I take the, the more uh, under national aviation policy for another day, as important, but today's our key focus is for people looking in. Chairman. Uh, Deputy Duncan Smith, six minutes, and I'll give you another an extra minute. Uh, these holding areas that have been announced past. Where exactly will they be in relation to the terminal buildings? So, Deputy Smith, um, we would, we would um, be using some of the outside queuing areas that we've got now, which are in place, uh, Deputy Smith, and we would also use some of our short-term car parks both in Terminal 1 and Terminal 2, that are adjacent and that are covered and can provide a safe infrastructure in the event that we need to triage. We don't expect to have that in place this weekend, Deputy Smith, but as the, as the numbers build over the summer, we want to have the contingency that should we be faced with a situation, it's much more orderly and better managed than last Sunday. So this weekend, the advice is, with luggage, for short haul flights, three and a half hours, long haul flights, four and a half hours, if you have luggage. That's if the you advice. have luggage. So yeah. if you would arrive for a short haul flight, three and a half hours in advance, are you envisaging that people will have to be outside for a period of time or will they be able to go direct into the terminal building? Our, our plan for this weekend, Deputy Smith, is that people will not have to be outside for any length of time. Um, it, it, there, there could be, like we had some, this morning at 4 a.m., we had some people outside for about 10 minutes. We don't anticipate it, but we want to be prepared for it. W what I would say, Deputy Smith, is that 90, um, you know, 94% um, of, you know, of all people were getting in through security in under 45 minutes through May. Like, we had a... It's, it's not where we should be. Yeah, we didn't think we'd be here after your letter last week, but we're here after the weekend. We've had, and, we just, and now we have a plan which is going to have gazebo terminal or gazebo holding areas now or covered holding terminals for in the, the summer. Event. In the event. But they will be set up for the summer, but not for this weekend, in the event that we have these issues. As the, again, traf as as the, the traffic numbers. increases. Okay. Do you have a plan to ensure food and beverage concessions are open both land side and air side in every terminal and every gate to ensure that people are able to get 
refreshments and stuff that they need, because that's been a key problem. Is there a plan to ensure that the sanitary facilities in terms of toilets and that are clean as well? These are the key problems. These are other key problems that existed this weekend. So, Deputy Smith, we've been working with our food and beverage partners. Uh, as you know, I think many pubs up and down the country are closed a couple of days a week because they can't staff, same for restaurants. And it's no different in the food and beverage sector within the airports. So we've been gradually bringing on as many food and beverage outlets as possible to ensure that we can give the customer service that our passengers want. But Deputy Smith, the reality is over the last months that we haven't been able to open them all. We don't actually operate no, them. No, I as understand you know. that. We but work with our partners. I, yeah. So what we will do is we'll, we, we try and make sure that in all the key, key peers mm. that there is something available. That, but there may not be the full variety mm. that passengers would expect. Now, it gets better and better, mm. but it's a very difficult recruitment market out there for all all parts of the ecosystem. It's part of the overall experience. If you're four, four and a half, five hours, whoever waiting for when you get out of your car or bus or whatever to get to your gate uh, and you haven't had a cup of tea or you haven't been able to use a toilet facility, that's a, that's a huge, huge problem. Um, the, the government we know didn't provide any conditionality in terms of um, retaining employees. You're losing €1 million Euro a day. Did the government ever say to you as part of the EWSS, because the DAA is a distinct case, it's not like other companies, right? This is a strategic state agency. But they did, did they ever say, look, you're getting this support, we actually need you to cut costs? Did the government, either through ministers or senior officials in the Department of Transport, ever say, look, you're getting all this money from us, we actually need to see you cut costs? So, so Deputy Smith, the money that you refer to, is that the incentive for the airline? No, 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 the, the, the TWSS. We, we're like any other business. No, no, you're, but you're not really. I'm just. Are you, no, you but how to, we run it is like any other yeah, okay. business. Okay, so so that never came from government. There was never any uh, because uh, give it, the, the, every Smith. decision that was made in relation to staff sizing, downsizing, right sizing, to use your language, was made by you guys in the management team. I am. We are on our own here. Deputy okay. Smith. Do, you, do you think you pulled the lever too early in terms of May 2020 for the uh, the, pack, the packages being offered to reduce staff? in terms of into the pandemic crisis. May did, did we cut to... Do you think you, you pulled the lever to cut as many staff as early as you did into the crisis? Did I make it too early? Yeah. No, I didn't. We were losing a million euros. We lost 284 million euros in 2020. Um, Was it too deep on the security checkers? Too, too deep, deep yeah. too quick. And Look, did the pandemic... The point I'm going to... Was the pandemic... The moment you, you were waiting for as a DA to make the cuts that you always wanted to make? No, absolutely not. Okay. I, I mean, categorically not. We, we, we were growing as we were going into 2020. Um, there's always Smith. a tension in the airport that there's always been a, a desire for management to cut long-term employees across many areas who are on good pay and good terms and conditions. And the sense was... This is what I'm picking up. And I've, say, I've had staff in more numbers contact me over the weekend like, who are afraid to speak off the record. They're clarifying, can I, I, this won't go anywhere, will it? Because they, who are still there. The culture is such that they're, they have this fear. It's incredible. I felt like a Cold War spy master I, I, trying I to talk to people. Like, firmly like, refute that, Deputy no, Smith. I, like, uh, I, I, and I think you, you have got a good understanding of our airport. And I think you know the people. I don't dispute that people may have said that to you. Yeah. But... Our staff engagement, the work we're doing with our staff, the work that I personally as a CEO do in terms of being actively on the floor, all of these people that I'm with you to, with today, we all one day a month prior to the pandemic would have done a frontline shift, be it cleaning, be it customer service, be it security, whatever, to be upfront with our colleagues and listen and learn and develop. Do we have everything right? We absolutely don't, Deputy Smith. Yeah. No, I, I, I'll just finish on this point. I thought I had a under, good understanding of the staff culture out there. This weekend has shifted it. I know it's a crisis weekend, but we have a staff body that feel very low and feel very battered and very I, bruised. Yeah. And my, my final question is, there's no upward uh, you've uh, uh, asked in terms of the amount of security staff you want to hire. Have you, have you, have, are you going to go higher now in terms of security staff based on your... Uh, uh, Projections yeah. thus far. So we currently, for, for, for the committee, we currently have 535 security staff in, in what we call central processing, so Terminal 1 and Terminal 2. Okay, we're going to take it from 535 to 702 members by the end of June. 
Um, so that's a gap of 167. So we'll increase it to 702, and then we will try and go again to 800 through the summer. So we have 104 of that gap of 167. We have 104 in training, and we have 63 who are, who are in a pipeline. But the, the reality is it's slow to get people in, and the old, you know, we want to get people on the flights. We, the, the reason why the staff, Deputy Smith, are feeling like that is I've had the opportunity to work in a number of different companies. I've never worked in a company where there is such pride, I think you know this as well yeah. as I do, by yeah. the frontline officers. Yeah. Uh, right, there is incredible pride. So that's why they feel down, and we feel that we have let them down. And we let them down this weekend with the rostering error that occurred. Just very quickly, following one, the 248 were the numbers of security checkers that were uh, let go under a voluntary redundancy package. Do you know it? Accepted that that was too grave of a cut. Yes, I do. Okay. I'll now move to uh, Deputy Downer Rook. Deputy Rook, six minutes and then an additional minute. Thanks. Uh, thanks. So, so I think that's the point. You, you cut too deep and you're struggling to uh, recruit quickly enough to keep up with demand. Um, you say that there is a resource gap. Um, just, just uh, uh, what level of uh, search unit uh, staff d would you need, do you need, ideally, to cope with the demand that's there at the minute? What's the gap um, that, that you have? Obviously, you're, you're aiming for 702 by the end of, of the month. What would be content for, for you at this point in time? Deputy, we're 60 security officers behind where we need to be. Okay. And... Um, this, you run on very fine margins. Okay. And if, if, if you don't mind so, me challenging back, Deputy O'Rourke, uh, so hindsight, you, yes, so, you, so, know, you let, said we cut too on. deep. I'll, I'll come back to you. Yeah. No, let, nobody let, could let have expected let me come back this rebound. Yeah. So, so you're 60 short, right? Um, for, for last weekend. For last weekend. Yes. And, and, and what will you be short uh, for this weekend? Well, actually, because of everything we've done and the challenges yeah. so, from the chair, we, we, we are actually so, going to... So that, that's, that's where I'm getting to. You, you don't have enough staff to... Suitably qualified staff to match the demand. And that is a pressure point. And you say you're running a, a very finite margin of, of error. Um, you said last weekend you were unable to substitute at short notice. This weekend... If the same scenario arises like last weekend and you're a little, you have a little bit more of a buffer with your 10%, what happens different this weekend than happened last weekend? Deputy, we're running on very, very fine margins. Yeah. And as I'm sure, well, I know you know, right across Europe, yeah. airports are no, no, about... Ju just a question. What happens different this weekend compared so, to last weekend? You, so, you said appropriate escalation in your opening statement, appropriate escalation. What does that look like? Do you have a, an additional reserve? Have you so asked we, we staff to do... we will have 40 more officers this weekend. Mm -hmm. We have brought officers up from Cork, which we're very grateful for. We have a very extensive overtime package in place, Deputy Rook, which is triple time. Um, we are, are releasing all available security staff from other activities that they might have been doing across the airport. We will be consolidating some of our gate posts. Those are, those are the sort of outside gate posts for where some of the cargo and other um, equipment comes into the airport. So we'll be doing a consolidation period to make sure that we've got 10% more, have 10% more lane processing. Um, obviously, we've got our task force. So we have uh, 450 people who don't work on a frontline role, who are all doing activities. I did Monday last week, 3 a.m. I'll do yeah. Thursday, uh, so I'll do Friday and Saturday as just in there helping. And, and, and those are the sorts of re redundancy we're putting in. And in terms of, so, so there's staff coming from, from uh, Cork. Um, what number of staff and on what sort of... So, and then, no, no, if, if just let me finish the question. There is a suggestion that there are other personnel that you could draw on, for example, uh, the, the Defence Forces, Civil Defence, Gare... Is there any other pool of people that you are looking for? And I make the point in relation to Cork Airport, and I made it in relation to other airports. Obviously, there's a, a challenge here for suitably qualified people who have the suitable clearance and the expertise. If you're leaning on other airports in your hour of need, 
that needs to be returned in the future. And I think government need to, yeah. if government have a role in relation to that, uh, uh, there's a national policy coming up. They, they need to, 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 to make due note of that. So are, are there additional uh, resources that could be drawn on? from? So, well, first of all, Angarda Shikona have been absolutely fantastic. And I couldn't, I can't speak more highly about the work that they have done, the local uh, 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 the, the, the local team there uh, at Dublin Airport have been exceptional and Drew Harris has got right behind it. So, so that's number one. Number two, Cork. We have somewhere between three and six officers coming up and helping us from Cork. You might think three is, mm. is not a lot, but actually what we need is uh, X-ray certified officers. That's, our, that's our, our, our key bottleneck at the moment. And having those officers up, even though it's three to six, depending on the day, makes a material difference. We've also gone out to the other airports, both regionally here in Ireland and internationally. The problem is, I put this in, out to the, to, into the EU to try and get security officers over here. Obviously, we need to recertify them, but it can be a quick recertification. All the other airports are scrambling for this. When I went out to the regional airports, they all want to help, but they've got nobody to give. Shannon has been, Mary Constantine, that many of you will know, has been absolutely terrific. Wants to help in any way. Can't free up any security officers. She needs them all. Okay. And, and that's the issue we've got, Deputy O'Rourke. And uh, what about uh, rehiring staff that were let go before? Um, you know, uh, they, obviously there's an issue here in terms of Garda clearance and the, and the hurdles there, and in terms of, of the training piece. It's the quickest possible way that you can provide additional resources for... for uh, so rehiring staff that left is potentially an option. Mm. We've had 5,000 applications for the jobs that we have in place at the moment. Mm. Um, and, and our preference is to work with, you know, there are people who have chosen to come into us. There were people who voluntarily left. So our preference is, is our current pipeline. Okay. So, so uh, and just on my, my, my last question, is just to make that point in terms of the underestimation of a factor in terms of the, the, the return back. Um, you, you've pointed to international indicators, and we in this committee have heard others point towards it, but isn't it the case that you have failed to read the Irish market? And isn't it the case that you have failed to read the Ryanair factor? Isn't that what's happened here? Ryanair, one of the, the most successful, certainly one of the most aggressive airlines uh, on the planet, have, have come back stronger than anywhere else. They literally said it. Uh, uh, Ryanair predicts rapid rebound in, in airline travel. The 31st of August, 2021, BBC News reported that. Didn't you miss that? Deputy Rook, you'll remember it went up and down, and then we got into December. It got very concerning with Omicron. January. 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 Ryanair sees very what? strong, uh, strong and, summer, if no COVID. And I would say that the government, which has the... Uh, access to, to some of the, the best research anywhere in the world was putting down a very significant and material amount of money to incentivize airlines to fly because there was a very real concern that they wouldn't fly. Mm -hmm. And so we had a budget that we looked at when we went into Christmas 2021, and our budget was for, to be at 75%. And when I talk to other CEOs, Deputy O'Rook, across Europe, What's terminal they, two said, they said, that's a pretty yeah. aggressive budget you've got What's there for terminal 2020. Two at? What's Terminal 2 at, percentage-wise? Um, they're they're uh, both knocking around 90%. And, I mean, t Terminal 1's at 95%, Terminal 2's at 85 It depends on the day. Okay. So when I talk to all the other airports and I sit uh, on a council with all the other airports, they were like, 75%? Ooh. That, that's, that's chunky. In February, as oil prices spiked, as Ukraine kicked off, as the cost of living was going through the roof, and as we were, you know, we were looking into the summer and we were deeply concerned, we should not have got rid of that amount of people. But if I knew now what I knew then, or if I knew then what I know now, excuse me, I'd have made a very different decision, Deputy Arouk. I'll move to Deputy Stephen Machos. Deputy Machos, you have uh, six minutes with an additional one minute. 
thank you, Mr. Phillips and, and your team. And it's good to hear you admit that that last comment there, because I think that's where we're, where, where the problem lies within. Can I just ask you in particular about passengers with reduced mobility and how they're going to fit into your plan? Because I do have feedback from people that they were stopped at the weekend. And look, I know the weekend was chaotic and you didn't want that, none of your team wanted that. None of us want to see that again. We just want people to avail of a service, state service, and to do that in a, in a comfortable and uh, appropriate manner. But people were stopped coming up the ramp. It caused great distress having to walk and having to queue. And I know many people were affected by it. But can you just be sure that that information is very, very clear? People will reduce mobility where are they going to be able to access? At what point can they... Will they be able to drive right up and be dropped at the door? Will they have to queue? Will they have to make extra um, arrangements? And just be very, very clear on that. If you're bringing in new staff, and when you bring in new staff, and I think you said the figure was 10% of staff, 10% uh, increase in staff and 40 new security people, just be sure that they are briefed fully. It's very, very difficult when you get new staff in, when you've been staffed and been there for a long time, they know the ropes, they know what to do, new staff, they can be over-enthusiastic as well. Just, you really need to be careful on that. And can you be sure that that information goes to those passengers that have booked, those passengers that have booked for that assistance, where the meeting points would be, and that that's clear? Because, you know, that that has to be a priority. Should I respond to that? Please, Forgive. yes, do. In fact, I've probably been remiss of... Uh, not, not probably speaking a little bit too much. I'd like to share some, uh, some of this with my team. Uh, and I'm going to ask Louise to talk about this as an area that she's been focusing on significantly because PRM... Mr. Darlton, if members uh, are coming in, conscious of time, members have six minutes, seven minutes in total. Okay, we'll so be I very want, brief. I want questions to be direct, answers to be direct, so really yeah. the public get the information. We're, we're absolutely committed, Deputy Matthews, about um, providing a, 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 a good journey for people with reduced mobility. It's something we were very good at before. Like many of the services, and Deputy Smith talked about the food and beverage, a lot of the services that we offer at the airport are really being challenged at the moment. But this is an area we have to really focus on, and, and particularly now with so many people in the terminals, it's an area where passengers are very concerned. But, but Louise, maybe just share it with Deputy Matthews. No, I just uh, agree with you completely, Deputy Matthews. Unfortunately, congested terminals and what's going on at the moment has a disproportionately negative impact on people with uh, mobility challenges and, and um, neurodiversity, whatever the, the case may be. Um, while we cannot do too much to reduce volumes, etc., we can focus on awareness, empathy, training and information. And I think that's where we really need to redouble our efforts with OCS, our partner, but also all of our staff on the ground to make sure they're highly aware, they behave in a very um, empathetic way, and that's what we need to focus on over the next couple of weeks in particular. So that's all I really wanted to say. And I would just reiterate to make sure that information is just clearly available yeah. to people that don't arrive at another situation with a whole new arrangement set up uh, that, yeah. that, that haven't been used to. Can I just ask it in terms of the numbers then entering the building and the numbers that were on site and, and this back up and if more people are having to arrive earlier and you're going to have more numbers on site for a longer period of time, are you at all times staying within building capacity requirements, fire capacity requirements, security uh, requirements at all times, including these outer holding areas, whatever you're going to call those temporary decanting areas, whatever they may be, you'll remain within fire and security uh, regulations at all times on that. So I, I might bring in uh, Gary McLean, Deputy MD for Dublin, but, uh, but I would say, Deputy Matthews, that the, the safety of our staff and of our passengers and the security yeah, is, is number one and paramount in everything we do, uh, and, and it's the first and foremost on our board's list of anything they discuss with us, and I, I think it's, it's critical. We've got a very good record there, but... Um, Gary, do you want to just update the deputy? Deputy Matthews, yeah, look, so, yeah, the, the safety and, uh, of our passengers are number one priority throughout that whole journey. You know, and the reason we have had, in effect, you know, access control into the building at, at any, at, for short periods of time over the, recent, over the recent weeks was, in effect, to ensure the safety of our passengers. Uh, we work very closely with Dublin Fire Brigade. In fact, they were on site this week with us uh, to ensure that all the process and procedures that we have in place uh, 
you know, manage the process safely uh, 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 and within any of the building controls that we're, we're obviously obliged to, to, to operate within. So all of our plans, all of those uh, holding points, and, and look, we, don't, we, we do not intend to be in car park holding, but if we are, they will be done within, within, the, within the building controls and in a safe and effective manner. That, that's the whole purpose of those. I don't doubt that passenger safety and passenger comfort is your priority. Of course, it is for every industry that provides the service. But in, in, in cases where we have this extra numbers arriving, holding for longer, and of course you manage a situation safely to the best of your ability as it happens, but this is a planned procedure now. So those numbers and that, those extra places, will you be staying within the building capacity requirements, security requirements and fire regulation requirements for people in, that, in, that, uh, in the building and the curtilage of Absolutely. the building? Absolutely, at all times. You all times. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Phillips. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Deputy Matthews. Now move to um, Deputy Cahill Crow. Deputy Crow, six minutes and then one. Thanks, Chairman. I just want to thank uh, Dalton Phillips and his team for coming here today. We've read your witness statement, and I think there's a, there's a very frustrating and sad irony that an entity which is all about moving people has been in a state of paralysis uh, quite a number of times. And what's really frustrating for all of us here, I was one of the members that came, I think it was the end of March, early April, and we were given reassurances. We were given time frames, in fact, by which you would have this rectified. That hasn't come to pass. And again, just last week, we were receiving reassuring emails that everything, again, will be fine. And that is... So, you know, there's this whole thing, fool me once, fool me twice, but the public who interface with your airport, who will travel out of there again today, and I travelled beside one of those passengers this morning on the train up to Dublin, leaving hours and hours in advance of her flight, absolutely petrified that they'll miss it. These are people going on holidays, going back to UK for family uh, funerals. Your public relations people have been on the airbus this week saying you'll compensate, but when they were asked about what level of compensation, it does, it's, it's totally vague, and I don't think anything appropriately compensates. So in a moment, I would like you to address that issue, but I just want to show, I don't know if you can see that, that's, uh, the, that's the departure gate in Shannon. They have a, a lovely graphic arch that says, please queue here, only there is no queue. You can drop your bag. And seven minutes later, you could be having a cup of coffee and waiting to board your flight. I think the solution to your problem, I think the solution to your problem lies in airports like Shannon and the other state airports in Ireland. You're saying it's up to the airlines to choose, uh, but have you, has, have you as Supreme Chief in Dublin Airport said to them, you know what, maybe we can't get your passengers on the flight this weekend, I would advise you to try Shannon or Cork or Knock. Have you communicated that to them? So, Deputy Crow, um, uh, Two things in terms of the compensation. Um, we want to react very quickly uh, and speedily to any um, compensation um, that people may uh, require. We're deeply sorry. If you've booked a hotel in Spain, are you covering the costs we of that? Will be, we, 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 we want to be very open to it, Deputy. No, we want I know to you want to be very open, but I want you to tell people, will you cover the costs of a hotel in Spain or wherever at the other end? Yes, if, if they don't have okay, insurance and it's our fault, absolutely. We, we, Deputy Crow, we, we, we messed up. We do not want to be quibbling there at all. Okay. And, and have you spoken to, to the likes of Shannon so that you can get passengers through? I think it's preferential to go down the motorway to Shannon than spend three and a half hours. Some people, even at four in the morning, you said, waiting outdoors. So, Deputy Crow, we, we are in constant liaison with the airlines. Uh, the airlines, as you know, choose where they want to fly. Um, based on where the passenger demand is, and, and clearly the flights from, from Cork and, and Shannon to various places across Europe. Um, so we work with the airlines. They choose where they want to deploy their but aircraft. Have you suggested to them that, that your airport can fulfil their needs on so certain days and they should try elsewhere? We, we let the public down in May. Nope. On, so, no, but, but very little time. Have, have, you, have, you, have you suggested no, I to just, them? I'm just saying, Deputy Crow, that 94% of people went through the airport in, in, in May, under 45 minutes. It's not where we want ha, to be. Have you, come here, we're running down the clock here, have you suggested to people that your airports can't fulfil their needs and that they, they should reschedule their flight or, or move to Shannon or Cork or okay. not? So, Deputy Crowley, let me, Vincent has been working specifically on this. Let me, let me have Vincent share with you. Uh, in summary, Deputy Crow, yes, we have engaged with the airlines. We've obviously run a, a variety of scenarios as we look forward to determine the, the future demand and the future capacity. And 
as part of that scenario planning, we have actively discussed with the airlines whether they have the capability and the desire to shift capacity to other airports uh, should the needs ar need arise. And when I say that, they obviously have the prerogative themselves to move capacity at any point in time. Um, and we have had open engagement with the airlines. Okay. I would say that there are a whole range of lo logistical challenges in relation to that, not least crew and resources on the airline side. Sure. Um, but we have been open <coughs> and explicit in our discussions okay. with the can, Ireland can, on that. Can I next okay. ask, um, your advice, your updated advice seems to be incongruent with what airlines are actually offering. So I think the current advice is to arrive on two and a half hours before the flight departs and an additional hour on top of that for bag drop. But let the likes of KLM and Air France are saying come two hours before the flight. So people are in a state of flux. They're looking at airline advice. They're looking at your advice. They don't know when to arrive. The other thing I'd like to know is that how chaotic how chaotic do you envisage things being when the new runway opens? So maybe I'll deal with the runway and then I'll hand to Louise and we'll talk about the, the passenger advice, Deputy Crow. So the new runway has been in the plans for 40 plus years, as you know. It'll be opening in April, oh, sorry, in August of this year. And I think long term it's going to be a very key and significant. Will you be asset. deferring that opening in light of the current chaos or are you, is it full steam ahead? So, Deputy Crow, we have a plan to resource up by the end of June, which, which I've highlighted. Um, it's going to be a very busy summer. Until we fully resourced up, we're asking the public to, to, to work with us. Um, but we would expect to be, from July and August, to be in a, in a totally different place from, so you from will what open happened. The runway in August, that you, you will fulfil that plan. We, we absolutely okay. will. And maybe on the maybe on the, the the passenger advice, Louise, do you want to just share the details? Yeah, Deputy Crow, you're right because we have a complex situation in the airport. In that, if you have a bag to check in, not all airlines open their bag drop desks at the same time. So we have a range of two hours in advance to four hours in advance. That's even just in Terminal One. So our advice is you arrive two and a half hours in advance if you can. Um, if you're checking in a bag, allow additional time, but you need to check with your airline about when their desks open. Um, some airlines are offering night before check-in. We are encouraging people, if they're able to do that, to, to avail of that. But it is a complex message, the okay. two and a half hours I, I think, for I think that majority. messaging is something you need to correct because yeah. I had a family in Clare contact me this morning. They were experiencing the problem, but they were also part of the problem because five of them were sitting there in suitcases waiting for that desk to open up. And that's totally incongruent to what you're saying. And very finally, there's probably time for one more question here. Um, the 40 additional people that you... You've, it's, it's not clear from the opening statement of what you said here today. It, it, on all shifts throughout the beginnings, will we see an extra 40 people there or is that a total of 40 people dispersed intermittently through various shifts, if, if that makes sense? Yeah, that's, that's, that's 40 incremental people that we didn't have last week um, spread out over the whole weekend. In addition to those 40, we have also our existing resources are doing additional overtime. And addi so over the course of the weekend, we'll have approximately 60 kind of full-time equivalents or heads that we ha didn't have last weekend. And they will be directed at peak hours. So uh, between overtime and incremental and additional heads, that's they're the numbers we're looking at for this but, weekend. Yes. But assuming you're, you're, of course, you're going to be compliant with working law regulations, some, at some times there may only be eight or ten people because, because of breaks and because of rostering. So it isn't really, and I think it's important that's minuted here, it's not really a true gain of 40. It's um, the 10% deputy, I think, is the number we've got to focus on. We've got 10% more processing um, power this weekend yeah. because of how of how the resources and that's how we think about there's it. A, there's a couple of hundred politicians here, but you're only seeing seven of us. And I think the same worry would apply in the airport context. You're you're telling us it's 40 extra, but that's not really going to be. There's not going to be 40 there at peak times. It's 10 percent more, so we'll have uh, uh, over 10 lanes open in each terminal at key points, which is a 10 percent improvement in terms of what we had last weekend. A 10% improvement would suggest to me that perhaps only 900 people, they might miss their flight. Is that what you're saying to us? No, it's not. A 10% is a very significant, because actually how it works is you need to get the processing going early on, as, as you know from any environment. A 10% improvement on 1,000 people losing flights. It, the, the issue is, is if, you don't get, if you don't get up and running fast in the morning, 
it's very hard to catch up. So this this ten percent is actually targeted more in the morning. Mr. Sorry. Many additional ends in T1 and T2. Many lands were open in T1 and T2. So we'll T2 have 30% more no, no, lanes. No, no, no. Give me the number. How many numbers? Ten. Many? So we will have 10 versus how six. Six. So there were six lands opened out of how many? 15. So there should have been 10. No, no. How many lands are there in T1? T1 can go to 12. No, I'm told there's 15 lands in T1. The, uh, there's 12 that we operate off. How many are there? 15. It's either, it's either black No, because we, uh, th th we operate off... 12 to 30, we have a training lane. The, the point is, we 12, would like and, to be in all and lanes. And six only operated in T2 as well? On Sunday, the results have been 37 officers down. No, no, where, just give us the numbers. We six, were, we six, were pro, at, at six, a period of time, so we were half, six half, for us. Half of the lanes, if you go with 12. That's going up to 10 in both places, in both T1 and T2, T2, this coming weekend. At peak periods, it'll be 10. It may actually go over in certain points because it really depends okay. how we manage it. But what I would like to say, uh, Chairman, is our ambition is to open even more lanes in time. We want to have as many lanes as we had pre-pandemic when people went through in I 20 let, minutes. I let members take this up. Yeah. Uh, if you're achieving a 10% improvement, you had a 1,000 or so losing, losing out on their flights last weekend. Does that mean that if we run that figure through your whole operation, that there will still be eight or 900 people coming into the weekend hours um, missing flights? Absolutely not. We had a very strong you, so flight. You, will, you, you believe no one will miss a flight this coming weekend? Is that your belief, I'm given the plan you've confident. put to government? I'm You're giving us that guarantee. Are you I'm giving us a guarantee I'm that, confident that no, no, Mr. 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 Phillips, are you giving us a guarantee that no one will miss a flight over the weekend? I'm going to say again, Chairman, that if if passengers will will heed the two and a half hours, I'm confident with our plans. We're in a very difficult situation. We're dealing with fine margins. We want people to safely make their flights. The experience at the moment is not what we would like it to be. We'd like it to be much better. No, no, like, it will cut to the chase here, Mr. Phillips. If, are you telling uh, people that are travelling both, both short haul and long haul that if they arrive two and a half hours before, if they have baggage an extra hour, if it's long haul three and a half hours, an extra hour, are you guaranteeing them that they will get their flights I, over I'm, again? I, I'm giving them a high level of confidence, Chairman. And that's, Why not that's, a guarantee? Because, Chairman, there's a, there's a whole range of factors. And that's I want your business, Mr. Phillips. That it, guarantee should be forthcoming. I, I go to members. Chairman, I want to, I want to thank you. And just, I don't see how a 10% intervention can, can achieve a 100% improvement. Thanks, thanks, uh, thanks Deputy uh, uh, Thank uh, you. Uh, Senator Dooley. Thanks so much. Uh, first of all, thanks for a very open, frank statement. And, you know, fair play to you. You put your hands up. You said it was your call based on the information that was available to you a number of months ago that you let too many go based on the knowledge and what has happened since. That's, that's fine. We can understand that. What you haven't concentrated on for me is what happened last Sunday and those 17 people that were scheduled that shouldn't have been scheduled. That's serious, like. How did that happen? So we haven't had any detail there, so can you talk to me about that? So those 17, and, and Marcy may want to um, give some further colour. So those 17, Senator Zuli, they were uh, in our training programme. Oh, yeah, I know. I get that. But how did they get onto the schedule? How did it make it all the way down to the front line? That's a bit like saying there were 20 people going to London, but you know what, geez, they ended up on the flight no, to France. No, we, we had a manual process failure. So we had a, I mean, what you'd call a handoff failure. And we made a mistake. We have corrected that anonymously. But we have a training team okay. that was working on no, one I get, system. I get all of that, but it's, it's just the, the, the fact that critical, shouldn't have happened. critical data like that got shouldn't have happened. put in. But, but what... Oh, yeah. are there con can I finish? Is, are there consequences for somebody? And I don't want you to come in here and name any, but there must, surely there's a, a chain of command. It, somebody just didn't rock in and move these 17 around mistakenly. Senator Dooley, we, and I know Morris wants to come in, but I, I would say we have a very, and this is back to Deputy Smith's comments, so we have a very committed workforce who are working incredible shifts. I know many of them. And, and, and the security leadership team all of who are doing multiple 3 a.m. shifts and then doing a day job. Nobody's trying worrying. to do anything wrong. Do you not accept it's worrying that there aren't checks and balances? We all make mistakes. I was very My concerned. God, I've, I've made plenty of them. So we were I'm, very I'm, concerned, uh, Senator. That, that, so, so, I don't know, so, Morris, okay. if you want to add anything to that. I, 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 I sincerely apologise. We made a mistake. And we hold our hands up to that. It's not we easy. did make no, a mistake. No, if I can, because I don't want to blame anyone. It's not about mistakes. No. 
But like this is key process. This is key process. There should be checks and balances. It should never get to a point that you have to apologise. You know, maybe someone in the chain of command says, I messed up, but somebody else caught it. To have such a critical um, error that led to such consequence, financial for you, distraught, dis yeah. you know, disruption for everybody else. And it's not the person that made the mistake. It's, it's the box in which it was made. It's the chain of command. So if you can explain that a little bit better, it would be helpful or not at least come back to us on it. Because that, to me, speaks to an overall cultural issue around the processes that you have. And I'll move then to this point. So you're now talking about, which is a good idea, the idea of cordons, and you hold people back and you stage them. That would seem to me to be a fairly obvious thing. I just don't understand why that wasn't deployed quicker. So it goes back to this process, process, checks, balances, all of that. I can't understand why that wasn't deployed more quickly. Like, you do risk profiling, you do risk analysis, you do risk planning. You know, there's a, a suspect package found, you've got to get people out. H have you, had you thought that through? Okay, so it was that the lanes were... Pa there, there was nobody to process people, but there are other things that cause chaos from time to time at an airport. And it doesn't seem to me that you had something to deploy out the drawer, that you already had everybody trained in, no different to a fire drill in this building. We know when it happens, there's people on each corridor that tell us what to do and we follow it. It wasn't there, Senator, folks. I, I, I fully uh, empathise with what you're saying. We've been 151 days this year. We've had two really difficult days when we really let customers down uh, with, with, with real, real challenges. Um, 149 days, we've done a solid job. No, and, and I get that, but you see... In, you know, we were in the IAA the other day. The Aviation Authority, who are responsible for the way planes fly, they can't have an off day, because if they do, 30 aircraft yeah. crash yeah. into each other. You seem to have a more lax approach, because I'm not getting the sense from you or your team that you have a response available, or that you have a drill available to you when it hits the fan, quite frankly. When the muck hits the fan, there doesn't seem to be a, a, a response that follows a rigorous routine. You know, if X happens, then you proceed through. The I, and I'll bring Gary in, Senator. But what I would say is, in security, it, as you know from from your discussion with the IAA, it's it's there is no um, margin for error. Yeah. So. People who do this skilled job are certified, and we can't just, if, if, if one doesn't turn up, get somebody else. No, no, and I In get terms that. of the queue management... And, and I get that, okay. but you, I think you're missing the point. I, I, I want to... We all know things happen, you know. But when they happen, there should be a response. And I'm not getting the sense from you that there was a, a plan in place to deal with it. We all get inconvenient. I've missed flights. Yeah. I've had layovers. Yeah. I've been delayed. When I worked and lived in Gary, the world, I travelled a lot. share with the, with the Senator? Yeah, Senator, look, 100% um, our focus is on safety. Our focus is on ensuring we have uh, business continuity and plans for all eventualities. We do have a business continuity of, uh, uh, plan in relation to the event that happened. Um, on the day, queues were queues built outside the terminal, and we use that continuity, business continuity plan around controlling accidents into the, into the um, building to ensure the safety of passengers. Mm -hmm. Uh, queues developed an awful lot quicker than, than we, we would have anticipated, obviously, as a result of the, 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 the reduced processing. Um, and the plans that would have been, which we will put in place if it happens again, required areas of the car park. Okay, so there's, some, be, there's some learnings. So, you know, no, I so get that. Learning. So we'll move we, on we, then. Thanks for that. I have a concern about the way in which uh, the security lanes operate. We all have had experience of different airports. I think it's outdated. Um, I think it was outdated when it was built. I don't think you have enough space up there, based on what I see in other airports, in terms of the way people have to snake around. Uh, the, the point from the back to the front is, is poor. Um, your, for the want of a better word, your basket delivery system is like something you'd see in a, a in a, a, some kind of an antiquated airport. Like even Terminal One brings the basket back quicker. I see because I go through the airport quite a bit. I just see the things that cause delays. And that's, there's a very poor layout there by comparisons to even Terminal 1 at times. Shannon Airport has been mentioned. For sure, they put in new equipment. You didn't. Um, I think you can maybe tell us about that 
that allows people to leave the liquids in the bags, which get people through a lot more quickly. Um, so, like, I'm just concerned. Any time I go through that airport, I see a new concession shop opening in the Mall. There's new construction works around it. It seems to me that you're more interested in, and this isn't meant to be overly critical, but you're more interested in the retail offering uh, in terms of operating as a, as, as, a, as a glorified department store than you are about processing passengers. I would contend the reason for that is you know that you have the airlines by the, by, by the, by the throat because there's, no there's no effective competition. So you can ease off, if you want, on, on the passenger experience so long as you're getting money from them in the, in the shopping mall. The CT scanners. Why, why yeah. Shannon have yeah. them and, and DA yeah. doesn't? So, so I would just say that the, the airlines have the ultimate movable asset. We don't have the airlines buy anything, Senator Dooley, quite the opposite. They, they have all the power in the relationship at the moment because they can move their, their asset wherever they want. They go where critical mass of passengers are. You know that now better than I do. You know as well as I do that capital city where the volume of passengers are. You have the air. You have the air. We have a very clear plan on the security. Yeah, yeah, if I can come back to your, your, your comments on the, the security sector, I do agree with you. Our passenger experience in Terminal One, in particular, from the security area, could be much better. Um, in Terminal Two, too, by the way. Uh, well, I think Terminal Two is, is is probably better than Terminal Terminal One, but, but all of our security equipment is in full compliance with with the regulations. And we do take That's our security not, again, equipment. Sorry, Chairman, if, if, I can't. If, I know I can't. Look, can we, we know there. Of can course, I, of can course, I, you're can in. I finish. There's a limited amount of time. Yeah, okay, and I just need to be question, really. They are in compliance. There's no, I'm not questioning the compliance. But you've been through other airports as well. You go to various different shows. You go to conferences. You see what's out there. New equipment is coming, and, and there are real advances as Shannon has done with yeah. the C3, and that's something we're very focused on. Uh, there, are, there, are, there are a number of large airports that are, are starting to operate it in small numbers. We see a big opportunity to okay. do it, Senator Dillon. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we we have invested significantly in our whole baggage system, which passengers wouldn't see, which is in the depths. And that, we, that, that has been our priority over the last couple of years. Thank and you. we are now moving on to our central search. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Uh, well, now, um, it's just the uh, Deputy Lowry. Uh, six minutes with one. From all of the discussion and the debate that has taken place, the nub of the issue is that you don't have enough of staff to cater for the number of people who are running through the airport. And the real question here is, you disemployed hundreds of experienced staff, and there's no doubt now you've conceded that you did it too quickly, you cut too deep. And what I'm interested to know is, what process did you engage in before you made that decision. It obviously started at, at, at possibly uh, DMD looking at it. Uh, it. I'm sure it went through the Department of your financial unit. It went through at executive level and it went through at board level. And I, I, am I right in saying you have four worker directors on your board? Yeah, I, I, I'm amazed that a plan like this, which had such implications uh, for the airport, and for the staffing of the airport, that it actually got through. And I really want to ask the question as well, was government informed of this? Like, you were, at this stage, you were like any other company, as you say yourself, you were drawing down the wage uh, subsidy, I presume, for some of, of your workers. So how much money did the company generate in, in, under the wage subsidy scheme? I have a business, and I didn't engage in the wage subsidy scheme, but there's one thing I knew for certain, that if I didn't keep my staff during COVID, I would have no business when COVID was over. And I can't understand how all you intelligent people out there, with all the advices you had, the communications that you had with the Department of Transport, the Department of Transport is a huge unit within our public service. We have two ministers who are bust loads of advisors. I can't understand how none of you, nobody could pick up the implications of what you were actually doing and the decision that you made to disemploy so many people so quickly. Um, I, I, I really find it difficult to understand how you didn't anticipate that this was going to be a problem. Deputy Larry, <laughs> and I might bring Catherine in here. There were no material analysts out there who were reporting that 2022 would be where it was going to be. There were none in Ireland, in Europe, of any credibility. S&P, 
uh, Fitchers, uh, ACI, EATA, none of them saw this. They all saw 2024. And we took the best advice, Deputy Larry, that we could take. The government was fueling in 90 million to try and do some incentives. We acted with the best information we had. We, uh, uh, Deputy Larry, nobody saw that. And, and that's why up and down this country, there are restaurants, there are hotels, there are bars that, 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 that aren't open at the moment. Mm -hmm. Catherine, do you want to just give some comment? I, I don't, well, my, my point is, you mentioned earlier on that you're like any other business. You're not. You're not. And you, you're not like any other mm -hmm. business. You are a strategically important part of corporate Ireland. And I can't understand that if you, when you were losing all this money and at the same time you were drawing the wage, the wage subsidy scheme from the National Exchequer, I can't understand uh, why somebody can go to government and say this is likely to be the result of and the implication of the mm. decision that we're making. I cannot understand it. I, well, I, I, might, just, I yeah. might just I address those. Say, I feel sorry. There's a lot of you in here probably mm. who can take some of the blame. Mm -hmm. But my God, there's a lot of people out there, including government ministers and government advisors, who should have seen this coming down the line. And can I say to you that, that as, a, as somebody who has some clue about a business, the, the cost of what you have done is going to outweigh what you think you saved, because you're now into a situation where you're paying treble time, where you're paying compensation. So the exercise that you're involved in now is hugely expensive, and nobody can put a price on the reputational damage that has happened both to your organisation and to the country in general. Pick up the New York Times last weekend and see, and look at the international publicity that the events have <coughs> got. You could put, nobody could, could buy that kind of bad publicity. So the point I'm making to you is, this was badly thought out from the start, uh, and you know um, I'm not so sure from everything you said today. I accept that you're totally genuine and you're saying everything in good faith, but I really don't think the answers that we've got today are, are going to uh, address the problem. And we we will, in my view, I, I wouldn't ask you for a guarantee because I think it's not it's impossible to give a guarantee. But I think from what, what everything you've said. Uh, there's an inevitability about further delays at, at, at Dublin Airport. Um, can, can I just, can I just address just some sure. of those points? Because you're absolutely right. I mean, DAA is a critical piece of state infrastructure. We are a semi-state body, but we're a commercial entity. So I suppose we are required to fund ourselves from our profits. And we also um, fund ourselves through accessing debt in the capital markets and historically from the European Investment Bank. So we have a credit rating and we absolutely need to protect our financial profile so that we can continue to access capital markets on a go-forward basis. So when this crisis hit, absolutely it became evident that the aviation industry was one of the most significantly impacted industries. And I suppose as, as the months and weeks passed, it also became clear that this crisis was going to impact us for a significant amount of time. Dalton has referenced on a number of occasions that all of the industry analysts throughout the course of the two years that the, the pandemic impacted us suggested we wouldn't be back at 35 million passengers until 2024 and 2025. And just to be clear, we would have had a payroll cost at the end of 2019 of 20 million a month with 3,000 domestic passengers to service 35 million passengers. The EWSS and TWSS supports that we got were about 4 million of that. Our staff took pay co cuts, which were about another 2 to 3 million of that a month. So we were ultimately able to remediate our 20 million a month payroll cost onto about 9 million a month. And we absolutely needed to do that, or else we would have been losing a million euro a day, as has been referenced by us, for the whole two years. And that would have categorically damaged our financial profile for the next number of years. We were always mindful that we needed to be able to get back off the mat when COVID had, had stopped impacting us and be able to, to do our business again. So I suppose that's a little bit of context around why we felt that we needed to make that decision. Okay, I, look, you, you give me an answer. I would have thought that your reputational profile was more important than your financial profile, particularly when you could have reached out to government and sought support in view of the circumstances that you found yourself in. Could I ask one final question of you? Um, <coughs> Could you tell me what's the ratio of permanent staff to casual staff to temporary staff at the airport? Um, like the the this, we've heard a lot of discussion about the contracts, and I know people that have made an application uh, for the jobs that are there. Now, the contracts you're saying is twenty. You guarantee twenty hours, but 
after that, uh, it, it's possibly 40 people are on standby. Now, you're obviously, when it comes to recruitment, you're kind of restricting yourself. For instance, if somebody in Tipperary applies for a job at the airport, and they're given 20 hours, and they're told they're on standby for the other 20 hours. So at short notice, they have to get from wherever it is, the Midlands, uh, to the airport. So I, I think you have to get back to the stage of the airport where you have a permanent, fully trained, qualified, professional staff that can expedite proceedings. And, and you have been too reliant on casual staff, and the contract that you have out at the moment leads me to believe that that's the way you're going to go forward as well, with, 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 with casual contracts. Could you tell me what is the race here? I, I'd like to bring Brendan in, because this is something that we're really focusing on at the moment, particularly in this labour market. Yeah. Thank you, Larry. Um, I think it's very important we get across that the last thing DAA wants to offer our colleagues are contracts that are wouldn't lend themselves to people having a decent standard of living and having some certainty with regard to when they work and how they work. And I can understand how people see those type of contracts that typically sort of exist in the retail sector, but it doesn't operate like that in aviation. So the vast majority of our employees would be permanent full-time employees, and particularly in this area where people work, 75% of the people, the ASU officers, would work what I call static rosters. So there's no fluctuation in either the number of hours they work or when they work. So they have absolute certainty there. In the model that we brought in uh, as arising from COVID, we have 25% of people who are on a flexible pool roster, 20 to 40 hours. They get 30 days notice of a 30 days roster, so 60 days before there's any change in people's roster. But I can absolutely tell you there is no intention of DAA to go down the road of bringing in sort of casual contracts for employment that wouldn't, it's not in our interest because we won't have, retention will be an issue. We have huge issues around guard clearance, training. So it's not in our interest at all to have turnover employees. We want to make sure we offer a package that attracts people to work in the DAA. And I believe that we do. And I think the 4,000 applications that come in for these roles in ASU are demonstrable proof of that. So absolutely we're committed. And me as the head of ER, and we work with the heads of HR in each of the business units, look at the contracts. We engage with our trade union partners. All the contracts we have are all negotiated and agreed with all the unions that exist in DAA. But it's absolutely, and I can give this committee an assurance, not our desire to have contracts that encourage people to leave. That is not in our interest, and it's not how we want to treat our employees. Absolutely not. Thanks. Uh, uh, Senator Jory Bottomer. Uh, six minutes in Denmark. Good morning, Chairman. Um, and can I welcome our representatives from the? And can I begin um, by asking Mr. Phillips, um, would you apologise to your staff today here? I know you apologise to the travelling public. Can I ask you just because I think it's a mistake today that you didn't bring in one of your work with directors or one of your staff on the front line. Um, and I might ask you to begin if you would apologise to your staff as well, because in fairness to them, and I know some of you in the room today were there last Sunday. Um, you got the brunt of the abuse that was deserved of the decisions, but not of the staff at the front line. Unreservedly, be one of our staff members who had to deal with a working environment that they never signed, signed up for, yeah. Senator Barrett. Thank you, because it is important, and you have said today, and in, in our meeting with you on the 4th of April, you did pay tribute to your staff. And I want to thank you for coming in here today for your honesty and your candour uh, with us today. Mr. O'Hanlon, Claire Byrne Live last Monday night had a member of, or a former member of staff on. Anecdotally, I speak to members of staff in DA, both in Dublin and Cork, and I think you've got wonderful staff. But I'm told, rightly or wrongly, that part of the issue is the staffing contracts. And based upon today's presentation, so for example, at 3 a.m. on a Saturday morning, um, what happens next weekend if a 3 a.m. shift, the same event occurs this weekend where you have 17 people or 20 people or 37 people not coming in? What happens then? How do you incentivize the 3 a.m. shift people? Is it the contracts are wrong? No, I don't believe so. Um, we don't have... Uh, the contracts are, are very clear. Uh, the contracts are incorporated shift premium for, uh, for the employees. Um, if, you, if you look at we don't have that issue at all other times of the year. 
except what happened last Sunday is a combination of a number of factors which my colleagues have touched on. Today. But what happens this weekend if the same thing happens in the exact same manner? But I don't, pretty close to I don't believe any of that relates back to the contract of employment. You don't? No, I don't believe okay. that causes the issue. I mean, people okay. have been absent, colleagues have been absent for, for whatever okay. reasons. We, we do have a very attractive sick pay scheme. We cover people. But I don't believe the contract uh, contributes to that. OK, OK. Can I ask in the context of... Uh, when does the weekend begin for this weekend? When is this whole new four-point plan kicking in? So, uh, the bank holiday weekend, the four big days, Senator Buttermer, are really Friday, Saturday, Saturday Sunday, Sunday and Monday. Okay. Uh, could, I, could I appeal to you, and I know you've had members of your crew or your staff rather on public airwaves, it is important through social media, through the national airwaves, through your media, that you communicate directly with people. Can I ask you to do that on a really regular basis, not just kind of through here, but in, it is important that, we, that you do communicate with people. Can I ask just in the context of, and you use the, the phrase processes issue, uh, on, on page three of your presentation to us, points 33, 34, the issue of, of for, for, so for the travelling public, they have no interest in the minutiae of who's, who can open what lane or who can close what lane. Have you empowered staff to be able to do that in, the, in this coming weekend? Where you said that they haven't been certified or that, that, that can be readily substituted by other DEA staff. Is that process issue solved now? So, uh, maybe you want to cover the, the communication point first and then I'll cover, or Morris can cover the, the process piece. Thank you, Senator Bottomer. I think there's been an average over 300 articles or interviews broadcast on um, what happened and transpired at Dublin Airport each day since last Sunday. I can assure you that both I and my communications team have been readily available to all members of the media, those here present uh, and those uh, in the broadcast, print and online media at all times and will continue to be. We will have a rigorous and robust communications plan around the four-point plan for this bank holiday weekend, and we'll certainly be engaging with the media immediately after this afternoon's session. Thank you. Sorry. Some clarity, Senator Bottomer, on that process. Just, sorry, and, and, and apologies for my lack of technical know-how, but you said in your presentations this afternoon that certain staff can't open lanes or lines, and other, only some certain staff can open lines. And points 33, 34. 34, many of those 37 staff have particular clearances and certifications required to open and operate a lane. Correct. So is that process being changed that we won't have that situation? It depends if on the certification. So maybe, Morris, you want to share? Yeah, so only certified screeners can, can work in screening. Right. Um, so what we've done for this weekend is we have more certified screeners working. Um, so it's not so much a process issue. Uh, there was a process issue as the... As the Senator pointed out earlier with respect okay. to our planning for the weekend. So that, that okay. certainly was a process issue. Okay. okay. Can I just conclude, Chairman, by saying two things? And I thank you. And I apologize if you asked another meeting. Uh, you are a strategically important state asset facility service. It should have been classified accordingly. Um, I do believe, Chairman, uh, and, and Mr. Phillips, to be fair, you are right. Nobody foresaw what was happening because I have gone through the news, newspapers and articles. Around the world, there are issues with aviation. So those who claim to have a knowledge that it wasn't going to happen, I'm sorry, they didn't. And I'd stand over that in this room today here. It is not acceptable. It is not acceptable that on a continual basis that some people have said today that they want to redeploy staff from Cork Airport to Dublin. We must not cut the capacity of Cork Airport or indeed Shannon Airport because it is critical that the capacity of Cork under your watch, under DEA, is kept to its fullest. And I would make the point, and I'll conclude in this, Chairman, for another day, there needs to be a re-emphasis and a re-accentuation of government aviation policy and the airlines, Dublin Airport Authority, government and the airports have a role to play because 85% of our travelling public are coming in out of Dublin Airport, and that's far too high. And can I just conclude, Mr Phillips, by wishing you well uh, in your new move. Uh, I know today is a disappointing day for you, and I know that your staff here today are doing your best, but I want to thank the staff on the front line last Sunday. I had people ringing me at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I thought, Chairman, that they were actually imagining or making it up. They weren't, unfortunately. But I do hope that we will never be back to where we were today, but thank you for coming today. Thank you, Senator. Um, I'm actually on the roster myself, so just a couple of things. For the public looking in at the moment, Mr Phillips, 
If they turn up Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday to Dublin Airport to get a flight, what will be the situation? How long will they be queuing outside T1 or T2? Um, and then how long do you anticipate it will take for them to get through um, their airline? And then from the airline, they'll have to queue to get into security. And then once they pass just checking at security, then they go into the security checks itself. So how long will they be waiting? So, Chair, um, our advice is, as, you, uh, as we've discussed earlier, two and a half hours if you don't have a bag to drop on a European short haul flight. Um, allow an extra hour if you, if you do need to check a bag in. We will do everything we can to get as many through, as I said, 95 uh, odd percent of all people through May went in under 45 minutes. Um, there will be periods over this weekend, Chair, where, tr where queuing could be uh, an hour. Uh, Are you I, expecting people to be queuing outside T1 and T2? Um, at certain peak points, it, it, there may be queuing outside. As I said this morning, we had people out for 10 minutes. Now, people were making their flights. The, 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 the queue was moving well. We want to be at 20 minutes. That, no, that's I, our goal, and that's where we were, and that's where we'll get back okay. to, Chair. I've looked at the, the weather forecast, and the... Tomorrow there's rain from 2 o'clock onwards. On Friday there's rain forecast on your early morning flights between uh, midnight and 1 p.m. The rest of the weekend at the moment seems okay. So if it's raining outside T1 and T2, what do you want to tell your passengers? So part of the plan is to use other areas, Chair, where we can ensure that passengers are covered. Um, we don't want anybody What are the else other areas? So this is the, the triage po point that Gary was talking about earlier, Chair, in terms of um, some of our atrium and car parking if facilities. It's, if it's raining, will people be out in the rain? Potentially, Chair. That's dreadful. I, I mean, uh, just looking at that on a human level, right? The, the, the plan is, though, as I said, is that we want to get covered areas so that doesn't I, I happen at all. I would ask you to address that. Um, secondly, um, I, I've seen your plan. And I, a few quick questions. The 40 people that are extra security staff, where are they coming from? What's their makeup? Okay. So, mm -hmm. uh, we have a training class coming out of training this week. So, how many, how many of those 40 are trainees? 30. And are, are there some of, the, are there some of the, the 17 that couldn't come on uh, last weekend? Uh, potentially, potentially. So, so, of those 40, you said how many are trainees? 30. 30. 30. And the other 10? Uh, we have three from Cork, uh, um, and then we have a mixture of uh, us consolidating our vehicle control posts. So we have control posts which are around the perimeter. So we're consolidating some of those and bringing staff in, and we're also redeploying some of our officers that are currently assisting with training, and we're redeploying those. So that my understanding, the there are 14 airport police available. Are they being brought, redeployed? Because they would have the security clearance. Are they being redeployed? They, they, they would not have the certification required for screening. So, so, so those airport police uh, would have been very, very heavily involved last weekend, for example, in crowd control. Yeah. So they have other duties across the airport. Well, I think with your respect, Mr. Hennessy, the word crowd control, I think, is, is a bit of a, a poor choice of words because from what the, the, the passengers I came on to me, right, they were in T1, which is very low. They were stifling. They didn't have access to services. Uh, and I would ask on this occasion that if people are queuing, that Dublin Airport Authority would ensure that they get access to water. Free water should be handed out. Uh, uh, proper sanitary services, toilets, food, and those sort of things. Uh, and going back, uh, Mr. Phillips, I want to get to a point from where someone turns up in T1 and T2, how long before they get to board their flight. I had a couple on to me on Saturday night, and they, they turned up on a short haul for two and a half hours to fly to Madrid, over to their family, a 6.20 flight, a Ryanair flight. They arrived at, at, T, at T1 at 3.30 in the afternoon. They did not get down to the departure on gate 119 
until 6.30 to see there was no one there and the plane was gone. So to say the people only missed, it, missed their flights on Sunday, that's incorrect. They missed them on Saturday. So tell me the time period, uh, Mr. Phillips, on that. So 94% of people were under 45 minutes through May. Now, I want to deal with the here and now. So, 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 uh, sorry, can, I'm yeah. just trying to understand so, the question. Sorry. So my question is, you were down, the question is, with the 40 additional staff on, on average, how long would you think people will be waiting to get through from the time they turn up at the terminal to get boarding their flight? From the time, I think they can be in, at, at peak periods, they could be up to an hour this weekend um, in the security line, Chair. And that is not where we want to be long term. So that means someone who is short haul, if, did, if you're telling them to turn up two and a half hours before, you believe you can get them through in an hour? There will be, uh, at peak periods, it could be an hour. It could be a little bit more. I'm very sorry for, for your friends who, and Mr. who missed Phillips, that flight. I, I know, like, we're in the role. We have to ask, right? It's in the media that, that, that reports that, that you flew to Saudi Arabia on, on, on Saturday. Is that correct? How long did you queue? And obviously, you're a business person. Like, do you think they were waiting four hours, right? They, and they still missed our flight on a human level on Saturday night to go over and meet their family. Did you, did you fly to Saudi Arabia on, on Saturday night? So I, uh, I flew out on Saturday. When I landed, I was going out to the Middle East. As you, as you know, for 40 years, DAA has been yeah. operating internationally. When I flew out when I landed, um, I was clearly aware of what was going on on the Sunday. So having flown through the night on Saturday night, I turned around and I came straight back on a night flight again. And as for the ordinary person, how long did you have to queue to get your flight from Dublin Airport? So on Saturday, the way I was travelling, actually, I, I travel various different ways when I'm going. Sometimes I travel... Um, through the normal process, sometimes I go through fast track, sometimes I go through platinum services. On, on um, Saturday, when I went through, actually went through platinum services, the lines at that stage um, were, 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 were okay in the business. I went through, I, I mean... How I, long were you queuing? I was there, actually, it took me an hour to get through. But so, so you're there an hour, I had this older couple there four hours. Is that fair, Mr Phillips? I, I'm deeply sorry for that couple. I am deeply sorry, and clearly, as we said but earlier, surely, we, there will be compensation. Sh surely you would have known, Mr Phillips, before you took the flight. What time was the flight to Saudi Arabia? So I, was, I went through... Um, I was at 4 o'clock, I had to be airside. <coughs> so the question is, surely at that point in time you knew there was chaos happening in, in, in Dublin Airport, and did, did you, would you not decide at that point not to travel? Actually... The issues weren't, uh, I mean, the real issue we had was uh, on, on Sunday. And, Chair, I turned straight around and I came straight back. I never even got to, 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 to my destination. And I did I'm two just, night flights. I'm just putting in context. And I'm deeply right? sorry. I'm putting for, it in context, yeah. right? The next thing I want to ask is, the, you've given us a schedule on the, 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 the plan. And I see Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday... Uh, first wave, second wave, third wave, fourth wave for each day. I see departing PAX 15, 12, 11, 8. Is that 15 and tort between T1 and T2? Mm -hmm. What's the breakdown between, uh, we'll say, in those peak periods? Is it half and half? It's about 60 40. So, so how many typically would be in T1? So take the first wave on the first day. Uh, we, we should have got a breakdown T1 and T2. The 15, how many of those are T1 and many are T2? T2. So. Nine and four. Yeah. And if you take uh, the first wave on Friday, there's 16. Yeah, it would be quite similar. About 9,000 would be the first, eight to 9,000 would be the first wave, I think. On, and then and nine and seven. In the morning, it's just over 10. And then on, on the first wave on Saturday, what's the break between T1 and T2? Yeah, I think on Saturday morning, it could be 10 and six. 10 and six. And then on the first wave in, uh, on Saturday, 15. Sorry, Sunday. Do you... Sunday, Sunday yeah, rather. So it'll be nine and six. And then on Monday, the first wave, fifth, sixteen. It'll be, it'll be uh, 
nine and nine or ten and six, sorry. Ten and six, right. Now, looking at that there, T1, where, where there's serious congestion, you have nine first wave Friday, nine the first wave Friday, ten the first wave on Saturday, nine on Sunday, <coughs> and ten on Monday. Is that sufficient? And, like, I'm hearing that if, you're, if you have 12 lanes open, you're probably looking at an hour of a wait. So the question is, and I'm asking that, you had six open on, on, in, in each terminal at peak periods uh, in, in, over the weekend. So six you're to, going... Six to seven. Six to seven. You're only going up from six to seven to nine on, in T1, on, and you're actually dropping the... Nine was 9,000 passengers, not lanes. So how many lanes? I want to know the lanes. Um, so on, uh, on Sunday morning, for example, we take Sunday morning. Yeah. Um, you know, we would estimate that we would require uh, 11, 11 lanes um, in T1. Terminal 1. And, and how many in the Terminal the same, 2? Roughly the same in Terminal 2. At the but should it come the figure you're giving the first wave is 15? I'm being shown. So, what, what has to be, so, so I, the, the information I want, you're not giving me, which is, I'll, if I go down through the Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, I just want the first waves. Give me the break between the number of lanes open, machines, lanes open in T1 and T2, for the first wave for the four days. It, it, it is dynamic, mm. but we'll give you an no, approximation. No, no, give me, give, me, give me a rough approximation. A uh, rough, yeah. Go on. Okay, so Thursday morning, first wave... Um, Thursday morning, first wave, we will have 12 lanes open in first wave in Terminal 2. And how many in T2? And we'll have uh, 11 open in, 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 T, in T2. Friday. This is from 4 a.m. Yeah, I accept that. Friday. So Friday, uh, we are currently planned to have 13 lanes open in, in T1 uh, and 12 lanes open in T2. OK, Saturday? Saturday, we are planning to have 13 lanes open in T1 and, and 12 lanes open in T2. Sunday? Sunday, we're planning to have uh, 13 lanes open in, in T1 and 11 lanes open in T2. Uh, and Monday? Monday, we are planning to have uh, 12 lanes open in T1 and uh, 11 lanes open in T2. Now, that gives me more reassurance. So that means that on Thursday, 12, 11, Friday, 12, 12, and I presume they're pro they'd be replicated pro rata down in the other waves. Yes. Okay. And, and, and they go up and go down okay. depending on the on the flows. Okay. And we have the ability so, also, so uh, chair, to move to move teams. My, un my understanding is, well. if there's twelve <coughs> lanes, you're probably waiting an hour. Is that is that is that reasonable? We would be very confident that with twelve lanes open, it'd be less than an hour. Yeah. Okay. The next thing then I want is, would you consider from six a.m. in the morning putting up the number of lanes that are open in each in each terminal? That would give people a lot of reassurance. Our desire, Chair, is, is ultimately, you were talking about how many are the 15 lanes in, in, yeah. in T1, and we were debating whether there's 15. Our desire is to have as many open as much as the time. It gives people a huge amount of reassurance if they know the lanes are open. But, but we don't have, uh, that's where we're building back into. That's how we used to operate, Chair. Will you do that? Will you, would you, or even over the weekend? But you're giving an assurance that they're the number of lanes that will be opened. That's the, to, to, to qualify, that's the peak period, and, and okay. because staff got to get breaks, um, it, it moves around, Chair. And this, we want to get as many as we can. We two, wish we could open more. The 248 that peop, uh, of security checkers that were let go in the voluntary door, how many of those are looking to come back, and do you, have you discussed with the unions about bringing those back? So, um, we haven't approached any yet to see whether they want to come back, but um, Brendan, you might share your thoughts on, on the discussions we've had with them. They are hugely experienced. Quickly, I'm conscious of my time. Yeah, so we, we did speak to the unions um, yesterday, um, the most recent engagement with them. Um, the feedback from the unions is not positive. Even if they were put on a three month contract? We outlined that we would be looking at a four month contract with a two month extension. Um, but there was um, a very negative response to that. Now, I've put a call into one of the union officials today before I come over here just to sort of understand what might be driving you, what might be able to move that on. Um, we have a number of engagements scheduled with the trade union around this particular population, around their pay, um, and whether there's anything in that engagement that might unlock 
or deal with any of the, the, the negative reactions. Okay. Our there. focus is the training that we've got for the recruits that are coming through. We so, have so a pipeline. Just do a quick reconciliation. Before you let your 248 go, how many security checkers did, did DA have? So we were uh, close to about 700 in the central search area. So uh, when that 248. So 900 if you take the total population. So 900, you let go 248. And that brings you down to. That was roughly, the 25% reduction, essentially. That's about roughly about 750 remaining. How many do you have today? So um, we're, we're about 170 short of where we need to be. Oh, no, but I'm more interested. Do you still have those 750? So we, well, it's, it's slightly apples and oranges because we, we have 535 in our central search area. And what's the difference between 535 and 750? We have 535 in central search. We have another 104 in training, and then the balance are in our vehicle control posts, our external okay. posts. And then the question then, how many people have you recruited to date in terms of the recruitment drive security checkers? How many to date? To date, we've recruited about 300 in total. Okay. How many of those are currently on the front line? Uh, we, we have about we have about 100 in training, so the balance are in, in on the front, front line. line. So when will, and, and, and those 200, is, 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 is 30 of those in the 40 that are, will be on duty this weekend? They will, yes. When will the other 100 be trained? And Over the next two, three, four weeks. And so you'll have all of those in place by the end of June? Mm -hmm. Correct. Cor well, by the end of June we will, yes. Can I now move to the next uh, member, uh, Deputy Amorakou? Um, <coughs> Guramayag of Kilair. Uh, obviously, we'd all prefer to be dealing with a different set of circumstances. Uh, apologies if I go back over uh, any ground that people have already gone over. I, I was trying to run two events and trying to watch this on my phone. So, look, it is what it is, right? Well, I don't think we need me to repeat absolute disaster, chaos. Nobody wants to see that. And uh, an absolute disaster from the state's point of view, even on an international basis. Um, could, could we just very quickly go back to, let's say, the 37 people, as in the 20 who didn't show up, um, and then particularly how this rostering issue happened or the lack of certification or not knowing. And you said, this is a process you've changed. This never arose before, or this we never had an issue like this. It, it, was this an aberrational amount of people that didn't show up? Or? This, was a, uh, this was a new class uh, of 17 trainees who, as I said earlier, a manual process where the, they were in the system to be rostered. In fact, they weren't certified. They weren't ready to go into... No, and I get that. And someone and believed they were going to be rostered, right? So, so it has never arisen before. You've caught the process. It won't happen again. It, it was a manual process. Right. And we have, we've put um, belt and braces in to, to ensure that it never happens again. Because, as you said, it created huge distress for the travelling public. Right. I'm deeply sorry for and, that. And very quickly, how many staff did you have on, um, of which, you know, like it's 20 out of how many? So it, a typical uh, shift, like on Sunday, was about 275. Right. So when we lost the 37, we were down to about, I think it was 238. Right, so 17, for the want of a better term, being your own fault or a process mistake, and 20 not showing up. Would that be the usual case that would happen? Would you have to deal with that? Look, it, it was a high level of absenteeism, but I think as we've discussed today, our, our staff are under a huge amount of stress. No, and, and, and if, you know, if people are sick, they're, they're sick, Deputy. No, 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 I, I, I accept that completely. Sorry, Chair, you wanted to? No, just, did 17 staff hold sick last Sunday for, for 20, their own 20. personal reasons? So if staff, and, and it happens in, 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 in any normal life, people will get sick. So, and do you have a contingency built into your numbers that, that caters for that eventuality? We, we would, Deputy, or, or Chair, excuse me, we, we absolutely do. This was over and above. No, no, for this coming weekend, do you have built yes, in? Did. So what can you cater for in terms of people going out sick on, at, over, the, over the bank holiday weekend? What numbers can you well, cater for? What, what I've said, Deputy, or Chair, is we run on fine margins, so... If, 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 you know, if we had a situation where we had 20 absent, which I hope we won't see again, um, it, it gets more complicated. Thankfully, we've got 
um, the plan in place, which is we've got more people operating. Uh, we've got a whole series of different processes. I, I can't give you a queue time, Chair. I, 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 I cannot. Do you have give people you on standby if that happens to come in and take up those oh, positions? So it, it if somebody calls at two in the morning, no, we don't. I, I'm amazed with that type of planning. Surely, in the circumstances you've learned from last weekend, you would have people on standby in the event that people, for whatever reason, were unable to attend work. When, we, when we want as many people to work this weekend, Chair, as possible to give our passengers the best possible experience. When we get back to post-June and July, you have a different level of, redu uh, of redundancy in the system. At the moment, it's very tight, like all airports right across Europe. It's very tight. We would love to have more people in, but our, our, our staff have been huge demands from them, Chair. I, I think they've done an extraordinary job. Okay. I, I, I think we'd all accept that, and that's accepting the pressure that they're under. And, and look, anybody who's been through in the airport in the last while we, we can, can attest to that. As I say, just we, we had a particular situation that we need to avoid. And like you're talking about this four-point plan, and, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase, but it, like I was led to believe, and I suppose the chair was probably coming from the same place, that there is a ramp-up facility or whatever, if the need be. Oh, Deputy Mirko, we are very tight at the moment and right. we will be very and, and the traveling public we are asking to bear with us right. european travel nobody expected deputy i'm not sure if you heard this earlier but we were saying that nobody expected this no, ramp no. up in travel uh, we've had this conversation before about 2024 2025 and, and look right. we, we can all say whether you know our anecdotal information that people said they wanted to fly the minute they could anyway none of that matters the senator Doug Budimer was talking about various different yeah. reports that showed where the analysts were. Either which way, it's the old one. We are where we are. Okay. Um, so at this point in time, you've obviously looked at Cork Airport from a point of view of resources, and I think we can make it straight human resources. Where else? See if you are completely under pressure on that stretch. Have you had a conversation with government about the possibility, and are there any suitable people within state services? I know there's much talk of the army, but I mean, I, I think we're at a case of whatever is necessary has to be put on the table. And just where are those conversations? So, um, Angarda Shikona have been exemplary and have really stepped up to the plate, and we're very grateful. Uh, many other agencies, the IAA, have, uh, have been tremendous in their support. Uh, <coughs> Shannon has been very supportive. They don't have any trained, certified security officers. So is there anybody can give you anything that you need? In terms of security screeners? Or anybody who can do a position own. that, so that's it. So there is no short-term fix. And the, and the whole of Europe is scrambling for these security screeners. I, I accept that, and I'm also, I, I think a number of people have already stated some of this is we're paying for the sins of the past in relation to a thousand people that were let go. And right, you're going to make whatever arguments you're going to make in relation to that. That is what it is at, at this point in time. So you have at this this plan is basically putting everybody you possibly can in play for the next period and ensuring that training is going to happen for those that need to be trained. Yes. The solution is yeah. getting new certified officers to support the team. They're coming in around 30 a week. 30 a week. It's a slow process. Definitely. That's it. Well, two things, I suppose. Is there any way of speeding that up? And beyond that, it was said to me, and I'm going to put it to you, that is there a difficulty in relation to some of the people that were let go before that, that like the training department was impacted in relation to um, the throughput of people being trained? Is that correct? Um, do, do you want to share on that? Um, we, we did lose resource in the training department, but that is not a constraint presently. At this, you, you've made up Correct. for that. Okay, Correct. okay. Right, another thing that's thrown in, and again, anyone who's travelled, and this is across Europe, um, in fairness, if you were with Aer Lingus and you were doing a bag drop over the last while, you know, outside of the Saturday stroke Sunday, you went in, you dropped your bag, and, you know, you, you disappeared through the security checks. Um, but... If you were travelling with Lufthansa or you're travelling with somebody else and, and the, the difficulty is you have to basically wait two hours beforehand and, and there's an element there, I, I assume that's airlines not putting sufficient staff on. I, I think I've been told as well that even there's an element of maybe Ryanair have failed in certain places to put enough staff on in relation to um, 
facilitating their customers through. I'm throwing these questions out. It has been put to me that this is the case, so I'm asking you. The whole sector of your group is struggling, and uh, whether it's ground handlers, um, whether it's food and beverage. No, no I get that, but, but t tell me this. Is it a case also that people have said we can get away with less people for the check-in bag drop scenario, so we think we have enough there, or is it a case that they are attempting to recruit more people I at think this stage? They're all trying That's their best to, to, to so give the best customer service in difficult circumstances. I don't know if, it, Louise, if you, or Gary, you wanted to add any colour to that? Like we deal obviously very closely with airlines and the ground handlers and all our partners across across the, the community. Uh, and I can assure you that all of them are really, really strongly trying to recruit and train. And, and OK, not certified, but different training that they require. Not security training, but different training. And they're all going through the same process of vetting, training and getting people. But it's a difficult market and they're all they're all struggling. But, but they're trying their best to get back to where we need to get back to, to have Dublin Airport run like it did pre-COVID. OK, well, well, look, I suppose that, that just is the old one. It needs to happen as soon as possible. And it's a pity it didn't happen, you know, last week. Um, and we, we have enough people in relation to being able to deliver the triaging process. Because the first thing that struck anybody that watched the scenes on Sunday was, what about the guy, or the, here, the person, who literally had checked in, who was carrying a bag on and was stuck outside, obviously waiting for people that wanted to swing right. And they couldn't, there was, you know, and in fairness, that's something that should have been built in beforehand. But we definitely have these processes in play while accepting that this could be more than absolutely perfect in the sense, depending on the weather and this being Ireland. Yes, Jeopardy. It, we do. We don't want it. We prefer that we didn't have it like this. But I think for the coming weeks, until we get all the resources back, it's going to be a, a challenge. Our desire is to make sure that people safely make their flight. But, but Eric, I'm going to finish on this. At the end of the day, we can't allow for every situation. But you know what you're facing. You're fairly sure that we can deliver a situation where this won't arise again and that there will be a significant amount of eyes on if there is a need for a ramp up type situation. We have a lot of confidence, Deputy. Um, the, the numbers are, 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 are high this weekend. And so we've put a, a clear plan in place to give confidence to people that they will make their flights. So then if you. But we can assure you, uh, Deputy, that, you know, should we, and we are not planning for it, and we're confident we won't be in that in a scenario like, like last Sunday, but should we result again in that scenario, um, we will have a better controlled triage operation outside of the building, which will allow for people to be segregated on the basis of if they need to go to check-in or if they go straight to security, if they're people of reduced mobility, and all the different types of passengers triage, we have. Triage if, 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 if you get to a point where you have severe waiting, yeah, yes, the full plan, but we have different versions of that plan, but the full triage yeah, but triage, has been triage referred won't to. apply in the normal way of people coming in, no. No, because they, should we people. have to uh, limit access I, control, it'll be for such a short period of time, it won't impact people uh, from a point of view uh, where they're going. Uh, and Mr. Mr. Phillips, you made reference. At this stage, have you, you have a, you have a very, very uh, stretched workforce, very tired, working huge long hours. At this moment in time, have you reached a point where you've, where your, the 40 staff you have in place is what's there. You've gone to the well. Is that a fair point, Mr. Phillips? Thank you, yeah, they can. So the question I'm asking is, and then on standby, and it's come up in the public, the argument as to whether you should be going to government asking for the army to be on standby, in small numbers, maybe 40 or 50 of the army to be on standby to pick up on the security juices if necessary. How do you, uh, how do you respond to that particular argument on the basis that you do not have that level of reserves in terms of backup from the workforce at this moment in time. So the deployment of state services is 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 absolutely outside of our remit. Um, but obviously, and, and if it if it arises, if you it need, would it. have to come from a request from the DEA. Yeah. So the question is, are you at that point? What's your view on that particular case that's been put out there? It's 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 a request of DEA. It's you're even in the airport. You're the professionals. You're the people that are, are given the remit to run the airport. So yeah. how do you deal with that? And, and Chair, if I could come in, because I, 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 I thought that you said that there was, state services weren't able to provide you with what you needed. Therefore, it wasn't a question. But it sounds there like 
I mean, the, the, on Gordish Corner, we, they, they are on our, they are on our premises. We work very closely with them. The person? army, remember, the army aren't, aren't, would not be certified mm -hmm. to run screening. The, no, no, I didn't say that. But there's a lot of. My understanding is about seven people on each uh, lane. Uh, two people will say meeting people initially. The one person on the on the screen. Two people in terms of security, and then there's two other people inside. There are activities. But they, they would could have do. to. Yeah. Sorry, all those activities, uh, apart from di what we call divestiture def uh, chair, which is when when people ask you to take your jacket off, liquids, gels, laptops, etc. That is a. You have to be um, guard cleared to be airside. I understand. But you don't have to be certified. All the other roles, you have to be certified. Well, my, by the my understanding is so. So so the the army could take up. Some of the roads. So the question is, can you address that point that's been put out there? Can I respond? Sure. Um, the, the army are not aviation security cleared, so so they cannot work in an airside environment. Um, were they aviation security cleared, the only role they could potentially do would be divestment, but that is not our our, our constraint. People like ourselves can do divestment, and we have been doing that. It's where we, we assist passengers to, to, to put their bags on the trays, take their jackets off. And the Army not do that? liquids and gels The Army not do that? They're not aviation We're security cleared. You're saying to me the, the, the talks about the Army being assisting in terms of... That's, that's spurious. It, does, it can't happen. They, they, they could assist potentially in other roles, but not in aviation security. Could that be fast-tracked? And, and I did ask earlier about was there any means by which we could speed up the, the whole training process? The, 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 the guard of vetting process, uh, in, back to Dalton's points earlier, the, on Garda Shikona have done phenomenal work and they have speeded up the guard of vetting <coughs> process as much as possible. There are a huge number of resources in that system already. DAA staff, the partners, okay. the airlines. So Thank they you. are pretty, they're fully tasked. Can I move now to Senator Lynn Boylan? Senator Boylan, six minutes and then one to, to add on. Great. Thank, thank you, Chair. And uh, thanks to, to the guests. Um, I just wanted to go back um, on the, the issue, I think, that uh, Mr Phillips was saying about using the platinum service. Um, my understanding is that the fast track lane is closed at the moment. Is that right, that all the lanes are just operating as normal security? No. Um, Senator Boylan, the fast track is open in, in T1 and T2. OK. And, and then see the platinum service. This service... Um, which offers for VIP guests and allows a private check-in, security, etc. cetera. Um, and, and you're familiar with it because you said you used it last Saturday, Mr. Phillips. I'm just wondering, did, did you pay for, for the use of platinum services or uh, did that come out of DAA expenses? No, it's, it's a charge made to my cost centre. I don't personally pay for it, um, but, I, but it, it's a charge that's made into my travel budget. Um, and as I, I was saying, I, the, the, I would travel many different ways. I think it's important to, 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 to be in all parts of the business, be it going through the fast track product, being the normal security product, going through the platinum service product. And it's an opportunity to see staff, talk to staff. Actually, it's our best performing uh, business over, over the pandemic period, uh, as people were, were concerned during the pandemic, and they've done a terrific job, and, and we're very proud of the work they do. Yeah, when you say people were very concerned about travelling during the COVID, I mean, clearly the people who are using Platinum Service are not just people who are concerned about travelling during COVID, they're people who have deep pockets, because access to the Platinum Service starts at €295, Euro, and then you have the additional extras, um, like chauffeur services. I mean, so when you used the Platinum services there uh, last Saturday, did you avail of the chauffeur element so, of it as well? Th this is a product where you um, you you are, you you are taken uh, to the aircraft by a different vehicle. It's a very popular product, uh, and certainly as a CEO, um, I think it's important to see all our different products. Um, and I, I, I don't use it very much, to be quite honest. Um, I happened to, 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 to use it on Saturday because was, I was wanted... That, was that, Mr. Phillips, because the, the, the delays in the airport? So you availed of Senator a, Boylan, a very high-end I, 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 system because there were delays already at, on Saturday when you were travelling to the airport? Senator Boylan, I, I, I did a 3 a.m. shift 
starting on Saturday last, sorry, on Monday last week. I worked the full week. I worked Saturday. I went straight to the Middle East. As soon as I heard that there was an issue, I came straight back. So I certainly, I mean, I wouldn't, if, if, if there had been an issue, I wouldn't have gone on the flight because the whole point was I went and came all the way back. I would have saved myself the uh, company cost of traveling to the Middle East. And I certainly, yeah. had I known Sunday was going to be what it was, I certainly wouldn't have traveled on Saturday. No, and I get that. And I don't, don't doubt that you work very, very hard. You're very well paid. But I don't doubt that you, you work very, very hard for that money, as do a lot of the people who are working in the airport um, who are on a lot less money. I suppose the question I'm asking is, you say you, you like to use the different security lane. So you like to use the fast track, you like to use the regular lane, you like to use platinum. So you get a feel for what the experience is of people who are coming through the airport. But did you choose to use the platinum services on Saturday because you already knew that there were starting to become significant delays through the airport and it meant that you didn't have to queue so that you were able to bypass the queue by going through platinum oh, services? No, categ categorically not. I travel a lot. Um, and actually, you know, I, I normally would travel either uh, through through uh, central search or through fast track. I would, you know, move between the two. It's an opportunity to meet different officers, and I, I would very much uh, welcome. You know, if you spoke to any of the officers, you'd know that I think they, you know, it, there's always a, a bit of banter when different people are travelling through that they know. So absolutely not, and I certainly wouldn't have gone to the Middle East if I'd known that this was happening, and that's why I turned immediately around and came back. OK, and, and see on the, the Platinum service, you said that that's, prob that's one of your best performing services that is being offered. And I think the, the Fast Track is also a, quite a popular service. I mean, how much do we take in and does the DAA take in on, from Fast Track sales annually and how much from the Platinum services? So we, we, we don't break that down and, that, and, and we, we keep that commercially sensitive for, for, for obvious reasons, not that I, d d it's that I don't want to share it with you, Senator Boylan, but I know that many of the competitor airports around Europe that we compete with w would like to know that. But it's, it's a very successful product. I mean, um, Fast Track's successful, Platinum's uh, successful, wins many awards right across Europe for the product that they, that they serve and actually the, the 295 euros compared to that product elsewhere in Europe, they're, they're, they offer incredible value compared to a Heathrow um, or a Brussels type product. And they do a brilliant job. Uh, so I suppose it's fair to say, though, that if it is a good performing product, that it's in the interest of uh, the Dublin Airport Authority then to not have our queues moving super efficient. So I know that I think there was a, a member of the committee was holding up a picture earlier around the no queues in Shannon. But is it not then in the interest of Dublin Airport Authority to have their queues, to have some delays at queues so that you have this product to sell for those who can afford to bypass the ordinary person queue and, and pay their way to a faster service? No, absolutely not. We compete against all the other European airports, Senator Boylan, and our, our, our goal is to get people through as fast as possible get them into the departure lounge, get them comfortable. Um, it's very standard across all major airports to have a fast track product. The airlines, in many cases, will, will demand that you have that. So if you're competing for um, a Qatar Airways to come or an Emirates Airlines to come into Dublin Airport, one of their prerequisites will be that you have to have a fast track product. Um, Aer Lingus are very proud of their fast track product. So, um, th th that is absolutely not the case at all. Okay. I don't know, Vincent, so just, if you wanted to share anything there. I have just one other question. I just, if I have time, change it on the baggage. But just again, confirming. So the, the, the cost of you travelling through Platinum comes out of your, your pay package with DAA. Is that correct, then? No, sorry. Um, to, to, to be clear, there is no such thing as a, a, as a free travel pass through Platinum. So um, when, when I did it in that example... Platinum Services will debit uh, my cost centre €295 Euros, um, because we, it, this isn't a product that we you know, use you know, willy-nilly or we, we, there's no gratuities here. Um, but I think it's important that as uh, a CEO you experience all types of um, service through the airport and certainly I would not have gone to the Middle East if I'd known that Sunday was going to happen. So your cost centre is your expenses? Yeah, it's, a, it, it's an expense that I have to submit, and obviously the board 
you know, or, or you know, gets submitted like any other expense. Okay. And, and so just then, Don, the final question I have is just around um, baggage. So we've heard a lot about, uh, I think, over a thousand people missing their flights over the weekend. Um, is there figures for uh, delays in baggage? So, you know, how many bags didn't make it onto planes or, or went to the wrong place or ended up staying into the, into the airport? Have we any updated figures on those? So I, I guess uh, the baggage is, is obviously uh, well. We facilitate uh, the, the you know the access of the baggage from from the check-in area through to the through to the ground handlers and airlines in the baggage hall. Um, you know the, the the actual stats around whether bags make flights or not are, are held by the airlines. We don't we don't measure or we don't have that information as an airport. You know we work with our with our partners to ensure. That you know the systems work to get the bags to where they need to get them to bring them to the to the to the aircraft, but, but we have no way of tracking beyond that as to whether the aircraft uh, air baggage get on aircraft. Were you happy with what you saw at the weekend in terms of the baggage handling? I, I think all across the industry at the moment, baggage is a challenge. You'll have seen that in, in a lot of media reports. It, it's not Dublin Airport specific. It's it's part of the wider challenge across the industry we're talking about here today. But but you will see that. You know, you will see baggage being being repatriated in airports all across Europe at the moment. You know, the challenge may have arisen in any airport, and it could be re, re being repatriated through Dublin. Um, so it's not always a case that it, you know. So it's very hard to pinpoint if that was a Dublin airport specific but, problem or not. Yeah, but I mean, was it a problem at the weekend? Was there an issue with bags backing up on on baggage belts and and basically? staff being overwhelmed by the amount of baggage that was coming through and making sure that it got to the plane that it needed to get to? Uh, look, as, as we said earlier on, I think all parts of the industry and all parts of the community at Dublin Airport are, are really struggling with regard resources. So I think the service levels that would normally be have been provided pre-COVID are, are all, all a little bit diminished. And that, that would include, I suppose, uh, the amount of staffing working in the baggage operation, but but we don't have those figures. That like there, there there's there are ground handlers and airlines that are doing those activities. And will, uh, will, you be, will you be asking for those figures so that we can get a full picture of just how bad what happened at the weekend was? Look, we work with them as I said earlier on, day in day out. You know, they're they're very very active in the recruitment market as well at the moment, trying to get staffing levels back to the levels they're at to try and ensure these problem, problems don't persist. We work closely with them to ensure it's as smooth as it possibly can be, like all parts of the operation, day in, day out. Okay, thanks. Okay. We now move to Senator Jerry Hawkins. Senator Hawkins, six minutes and then one. Okay, thank you. Thank you all very much. Look, I'm conscious there's a lot of the ground that, that I might have wanted to cover has already been covered. But, and, uh, but I do think, you know, as, as one of the few Dublin base members of this committee who are actually here, uh, like Dublin Airport is not just an asset for Dublin, it's an asset for the whole country. 87%, I think, is the figure of the, of the national aviation traffic that goes through <laughs> Dublin. Um, and when something goes wrong there, it reflects badly on yourselves, on Dublin, on Ireland, and ultimately, you know, we become a bit of a laughing stock. And that's the last thing I know you want to happen, and it's the last thing that we want to happen, because you are a state-owned, 100% state-owned company, um, and you are giving people who say the state can't run things ammunition when I don't want that ammunition to exist. So, you know, suffice to say that it's clearly, you, you've admitted it, it, it's not satisfactory in any, in any way. People presumably missed not just holidays, but possibly missed weddings, possibly missed funerals. Um, like, it's just not acceptable that people are missing flights. Um, I suppose I have a, a few small questions in terms of things, not just about the delays, but also about the general passenger experience to Dublin Airport at the moment. Um, but there are a few things, like, it was a 248 were let go in total, was that right? 248 of the, of the original staffing numbers, the, the original staff from 248 was what was let go? Actually, the, the higher now, the, the, the total number was much higher than that. We're talking about insecurity. Yeah, insecurity, yeah. It was approximately that number, yeah. And what would have been the cost to DAA of that, or would the, would the state and DAA have kind of shared that cost, or how? And we took the full cost of that. And how much would that have been? The full cost of our overall voluntary severance programme was 100 million. Oh, so, so 100 million? Mm -hmm. for but the total that was cost. for about 800 staff who left for, the for, so, close to eight, just under okay, 800. Okay, so... If, if 250, a little bit over a quarter of that 100 million would have been security staff. So 25 million-ish? 
it's hard to, it's hard to be that exact about it. The amount, you know, depends on, on no, I'm just trying to do the, I'm just trying to do the maths of twenty five million on two hundred and fifty people seems like quite a big lump sum per person. Um, what was the uh, what was the amount per person? It, it would be hard. I can't remember to be honest specifically for security, but you know, but, happy to come back to the committee on, on some more specifics. Yeah, on it that just seems to be a very large amount. And have you the, have you the ability in law or otherwise to bring any of those people back? And have you asked any of them back? So we've been uh, Senator Orkin, uh, on a very uh, very clear plan to recruit people. We've had over four thousand people who've um, been looking to, to to work for us, and that's been our plan. Our plan hasn't been to go after people who took a voluntary severance and left the company. Our are plan they, are, is to get there, people who want to come back. Are they in any way precluded from coming back? Uh, there, are, there are a number of tax issues around that's bringing point, people really. back. That's what and, I'm asking. And that's not our focus at the moment. Our focus is on the people who want to come, who want to join the company, not the people who, who, who've left. Now, to be fair, I think it would be... They would still need to be certified. I accept that, but I, I presume that people who have done the job before maybe took the, the package because it might have been too good to turn down, it might have been the fact that they didn't see the bounce back coming, maybe some of them were just burnt out of that particular kind of lifestyle and you know, it's not for everybody to be get, doing 3 o'clock in the morning shifts and 11 o'clock night shifts and so on. Um, but you're saying that there, either there are issues or there can be issues. There are issues. It hasn't been our focus, Senator. But, but I mean, if, if some of those people wanted to come back, could they come back? Could they reapply? Or are so they precluded from doing that? We, um, at, the, at the moment, we would want to work um, through this uh, and uh, work through with our union partners as well about people who, who had gone... I mean, we couldn't bring them back on any permanent basis. They could only come back on a temporary Why? basis because of the, the nature of the scheme. That's the point mm. that you're finally kind of acknowledging. And I've no problem... Oh, no, I'm sorry, I wasn't no, trying to... Yeah, yeah, I'm just... Yeah. Yeah. Because... You know, if, if, if people, if any business, you know, people who've done the job before are, are better skilled at it than people starting from scratch, by and large, unless they've been managed out for a different reason. Um, a lot of these people, the, the work wasn't there. You wanted to be rid of them off the payroll. You wanted, you wanted to reduce your cost base, which is totally logical and understandable at the time of the, 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 turn down, the, the downturn and so on. But that's it. Basically, they, they can't really come back. They're precluded from coming back. Technically speaking, yeah, from a, yeah, a revenue that, that's, perspective. No, yeah. that's, that's, that's the point I'm, I'm really asking. Now, you've hired, is it 300? Mm -hmm. So you're now back to a complement higher than what you lost. You lost 248, you've more than 300 back. No, we had people, we had also people who who, who, who didn't avail of the retirement scheme or the voluntary scheme, but also left. And how many are they? Uh, an, sorry, there was an, an excess of 60 people that would have left either through... Um, just decided to leave the business of their own accord. So the top figure was what? Nearly 1,000? 900? <coughs> Sorry, on the overall voluntary severance? In, no, in terms of security generally, there was the maximum number in security ever was how many? In 2019, before COVID. Yeah. Was how many? 900-ish? Yeah, 900. Probably 900, yeah. You lost 248 to the retirement scheme or the early severance package or whatever you mm -hmm. want to call it. You lost another 60 who just walked for other reasons. Mm -hmm. So you're down about 300. You've recruited about 300. So you're back to more or less full strength based on where you had been pre-COVID. Is that correct? Well, of the 300 that we've recruited, we still have over 100 of those in training. So they're not okay, available. So they're not available, the they're not available yet. Okay. So that's, and when they become available, you'll be back to full strength. We're getting close to it. Certainly by, the, by, by, by June, we will be close to full strength. Oh, June, this, is, this is June? As in today yeah, is the by first the end, June? By the end of June. Okay. And, but now June. we are actually going to recruit more people just to give us some more headroom through the summer. And in terms of COVID at this stage, how much, how, how I mean, I know, I know two or three people who've got COVID in the last two weeks. How many, how, how much is COVID affecting your staffing levels at this point? It is still having an impact. Uh, there's no doubt about that. It had a very significant impact in January and February. Um, but it's, it is still having an impact on our business. And in terms of the, the, the 37 who were missing at the weekend, 17 of them, that was some kind of a glitch that you thought they were recognised, but they were certified, but they weren't. Mm -hmm. The other 20, what was the story with those? They were, they, were, they were absent for a variety of reasons. They don't, I mean, it's not just a case that they didn't appear in the morning. Do they ring up in advance and say, I won't make it today or I won't be in, or they just, you're looking for them and you realise they're not here? It, 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 it's a combination, Senator. Some people are, you know, 
uh, wake up uh, and they suddenly found that they've got an infection or something and they don't want to come to work f for very clear reasons. But they let you know. They would, yeah. Well, in the end, it, we, we knew about the 20, but we, they were not in our... We, we yeah, weren't I, I know you knew all of a sudden they're not here and they probably yeah. rang you maybe an hour before their shift or two hours before their shift. Have you got an on-call facility? I mean, I worked in security when I was in university and, you know, I'd get phone calls at half nine in the morning, when can you start an hour and a half ago? And, you'd, and if you could, you'd turn up and you'd do... You now, I wasn't trying to load aircraft, but, you know, there was a backup yeah. of people who were ringable, who were contactable long before... SMS messages and so long Senator, before phone calls we, or we, so as it, emails. Um, when we know somebody is sick in advance, we will try and call other people. The, the reality is, though, that people are stretched at the moment. We, we had a, a discussion with the chair earlier about having people on call. We, we would love to get back to the resilience where we had people on call. At the moment, we need everybody we can in. Okay. So, when in they're not, fine so, so when they're not working during downtime and you just don't have the, the, the numbers sufficient to have an on-call panel at all? Regrettably at the moment. Okay. Um, I'm conscious of time. Okay, here, look, and um, maybe just that's with your that's indulgence. Worrying. Phillips, that's worrying. It is very worrying. Okay. I mean, that's, that's my point, is that there's no... That's our you know, ambition. If, if, if we had another outbreak of COVID or if something else went wrong or if some other, you know, things happened, uh, I, I'm very concerned about the fact that last weekend it was nice and dry but that if it wasn't, and I know other <coughs> members have referred to this, that lots of people could have got very wet, and particularly people with young children, people, older people, people with disabilities and so on. You know, I, I, we, you, you mentioned to us on our trip, and we appreciated the trip, and I remember journalists coming to me after, <coughs> look, the test will be Easter. And you passed that test, and you passed that test, I think, quite well. Um, but you re referenced us at the time, and you didn't want to overly advertise the fact that you would be what they, I think you used the phrase, combing the queues to try and comb out people who were further down the queue than they should have been and their flight was whatever. Um, did that combing concept ever take off or did it just fail at the weekend because you just didn't have the manpower to do it? So, Senator, we, we've had, um, through, the, through the month of May, 94% of all people got through security. Well, I, mean, I, got you. I mean, I did read your opening statement and I appreciate all that. I'm so just wondering, this combing concept that you, you were talking about, has that taken off? So combing uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a difficult concept. Maybe Gary will talk about it a little bit more. But we, we, we have to be careful to, to, to passengers who have arrived on no, I appreciate time that. and then somebody who hasn't arrived on time. That's the last point. OK. No, uh, I, I mean, I, I do appreciate that, and that's why I didn't want to overly sensitive, emphasis. It's very sensitive. It is very sensitive. But, and, and again, I think your triage concept of, you know, if you arrive six hours in advance, that you're not allowed into the queue ahead of the people, because the most frustrating thing in the world is if the next the 50 people in front of me have a flight an hour after me, and I can't get there because they're all <coughs> blocking my way. And that's where I'm talking about the combing of the queue thing. But you're saying that this triage thing, when will this actually start? Gary, do you want to? Yeah, uh, so as I mentioned earlier on, this is a contingency we have. We're, we're, we're confident that this weekend we won't, we won't need to go into a full triage as been referred to. Uh, but that will ensure, if there was bad, bad weather in your example there, that people would not be standing out in the rain for significant periods of time. We would use the, the car parks to do that. So we have it available to turn on. Should we need to turn it on this weekend, we may trial it at some point. Uh, but but as, a, as a general rule, we're not planning and, and to And final use point, just the passenger numbers departing on the, the, the Sunday, which was the problem day, what was the actual number of pa departing passengers that Sunday? It, roughly 50,000. 50,000. And what's similar. the maximum anticipated from the airlines? They've all told you if every airline took off with full planes, what's the maximum number could, will ever go to Dublin Airport this summer? I mean, you know how many aircraft are going to be departing. Yeah. You know the capacity of each aircraft. If they were all 100% full... No, about, oh, the, the busiest day would be about 59,000. 59, so, so we're about 9,000 short of that last weekend. So you have to build up 